Hi everybody! This is a puppy training tutorial compilation of the most important behaviors to train your new puppy. Firstly, congratulations on your new puppy and I hope you enjoy the tutorials. The first thing you want to do when using food is teach your puppy how to take the treat out of your hand. Some puppies won't find the treat very quickly, so if you're trying to train them something, then it interferes with the training. So make sure that they can find the treat immediately and eat it. Also, if you're going to be using treats on the floor, teach your puppy to find the treat. I like to use a pointing gesture to help them out if they can't find it. Good job! It really depends on your puppy's personality as to what behaviors you'll work on first. If you have a puppy that's very shy and reserved, I don't suggest working on that game which is no mugging where you get the puppy to back away from your hand and then reinforce. Instead, I suggest teaching that puppy, if they're worried about hands, to touch your fingers and receive a treat for that. So I'll link a tutorial on how to train that. That is a great exercise for puppies that are a little bit worried and reserved, as well as teaching the puppy to like handling. So conditioning handling to be something positive as one of the first things you work on with your puppy. If your puppy's not that interested in food, I don't suggest working on leave it exercises right away. Instead, I suggest working on attention games, recall, things where your exercises where your puppy is running towards you and being reinforced with food. If your puppy doesn't seem that interested in food, I suggest one of the first games that you play is an attention game where you're motivating your puppy to want to move towards you and move towards the food rather than a no mugging or a leave it game. Are you ready puppy? So you move away from your puppy, click as they come towards you or mark with a marker word and then drop another treat. Boy, oh boy, awesome. If your puppy was really not interested in food, you could also toss the treats to make them more exciting. Woo! Like that. It helps if you use treats that are a different color than the surface of the floor so your puppy finds them easier to find. Good job, puppy! Woo! If you have a puppy that is overexcited about the food, I suggest using low-value treats like his kibble to train with at first and work on impulse control games, calmness around food, and the settle. Now I suggest working on the settle with all puppies. Check out the written description for this video with links to video tutorials on how to train the specific behaviors I talked about in this video. Puppies start to learn the moment they are born. Even inside the uterus, puppies are learning through the environment. You can start to train your dog with food the moment your dog finds food reinforcing. As you can see here, this five we called foster puppy is finding food very reinforcing and we can start to capture the behaviors that we like. If your dog is getting distracted and wandering away, this means that the treat is not reinforcing to your dog. Try using a variety of different food to see which one is the most reinforcing to your dog. Remember to keep it healthy. You can use real meat and your dog's daily diet to reinforce the behaviors you like. There are many ways to reinforce your dog, such as using food, toys, and access to the environment. Here you can see I'm reinforcing the behavior of a wonderful recall and attention with the reward of getting to play in the environment again. You can also use access to dogs and people as a way to reinforce the behaviors that you like. An example of this is never letting your dog meet a person or another dog if they're barking or whining. Instead, you're going to wait for that moment that your dog is calm and relaxed, and that is the moment you're going to give your dog permission to go and say hi to the other dog or person. See you next time, and don't forget to subscribe to Channel Kiko Pup. This is footage of one of the first training sessions I had with Wish. If I didn't give her a piece of food immediately, which she would then take hard, she would bark, whine, and seem frustrated. I made sure she had a meal before training so she wasn't hungry and had food around the house. Anytime she settled calmly, I would get some food and drop it between her paws. 
I did this for three days. She started settling all the time, even when we had guests over. Because I want her to settle with distractions, I also started working on her settling while other dogs were getting treats as well as working for treats. Okay, so when I lure her like this, she kind of opens her mouth and looks a little annoyed and frustrated and is trying to bite the treat out of my hand, which is normal. It looks like I'm going to give her a treat. So instead of holding it so close to her, I'm going to hold it further away and just click her for following me in a calm manner to get the treat. Then, when she's good at that, I'm going to get the treat closer to her because when it's closer, it's confusing and frustrating because the dog thinks that you're giving them the treat and then you're playing a keep away game. So, of course, they're going to try and take the treat if you're um, tantalizing them with it. Ready? Great. So, I'm moving the treat slower. And then when she's really good, I'll hold it closer to her face. This is one of the first games that I play with all my puppies. It's not only great for building your relationship with your new puppy, but it's also great for teaching your puppy to want to move with you when out and about, and it also builds their motivation to want to work for the treats that you have. The game is very simple. You move away from your puppy and then you reinforce your puppy's choice for wanting to move in your direction. A very simple way to play this is making an enticing noise as you run away from your puppy. I like to say pop, 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 like that or clap my hands. Some puppies are a little bit scared of clapping so you might just want to try the high-pitched voice and if you're a guy and you don't want to make a high-pitched voice or you just can't, you can try whistling like that to get your puppy enticed to want to move towards you and then if your puppy has a marker like yes or a click you can click as your puppy is moving towards you or if you don't have a clicker or a marker yet you can just simply feed as your puppy gets to you and I suggest holding your hand out further away from your body and low to the ground so the puppy gets used to running to you and not jumping on you as they come towards you. As soon as the puppy is eating the treats, you're then going to take off running away from your puppy in another direction and then reinforce your puppy for getting to you. I suggest keeping these games extremely short, like 20 seconds to 30 seconds, and I suggest playing the games in your living room and out in your yard first, and if you have success with the games then, then you can try them on a walk outside the front of your house or in the park, like I'm going to show you in the footage with my own puppy. Now it's really important that you stay safe so you want to have your puppy on a leash and harness or a long line and a harness or in an enclosed area. So I'm in an enclosed area with a fence so I'm dropping my puppy's leash while I'm playing this game. I find it easier to play this game when you can create more distance from the puppy. Sometimes if a puppy's not that interested in following you um, and you only go five feet away that doesn't really entice them to want to keep coming towards you. So I suggest investing in a long line so you can get further away, further away from your puppy while still staying safe in case your puppy were to run away. Puppy! If you have a puppy that's not that motivated by the food, you want to refrain from moving the food towards the puppy and into their space. Puppies and dogs are just like us, and if you're not feeling like eating something and someone is trying to feed you the thing, it becomes even more punishing. So you can actually make the dog not want the food even more by trying too hard. Instead, playing this keep away game where you're moving away from your puppy, you can really teach puppies that aren't that interested in food to suddenly really want what you have. I hope you found this video helpful for your training. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to channel KikoPup. You can also become a supporting member of this channel by clicking the join button. See you later guys. Bye!
The positive interrupter is an attention noise that you can use to get your puppy's attention and to also stop them doing an undesirable behavior. This staffy is having his first training session on the positive interrupter or attention noise. At first I was clicking the puppy for offering eye contact, clicking the exact moment the puppy's pupils met mine, and then feeding a treat. Then I started to make the attention noise and click as the puppy's eyes met mine. If the puppy didn't look up, I would make another noise to get the puppy's attention so I could click the eye contact and reinforce with the treat. It's a good idea to keep training sessions very short with your new puppy. This training session was only 30 seconds long. Good job. Today's tutorial is on how to teach your puppy his name. Now my puppy's name is Halo, but I haven't started calling him that yet. I've been calling him Pup Pups because it took me a long time to choose a name. And that's fine. So when I get a new puppy, I condition Pup 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 as an attention noise so that if the puppy is doing something I don't like, I can get my puppy's attention and redirect my puppy to some other activity. But today, I want to teach him his name means look up at me and that I'm going to ask him to do something in the future. Step one, say your dog's name, put down a treat, then move away. Repeat multiple times. At first, I'm just going to say Halo, which is his name, and then put a treat down. And you saw he had no response to his name. Halo! 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 Good boy! Halo! That's awesome! Halo! So you might start out with this game every time you start conditioning your dog's name. Step 2. Say the name, click or use a verbal marker like good as your puppy makes eye contact. The next step is seeing if your puppy will make eye contact with you after you've said his name. So I'm going to say Halo! and he happened to make eye contact with me and I clicked it. What to do if your puppy doesn't make eye contact? If your puppy doesn't look up at you within two seconds of saying his name, you can make an enticing noise to capture him looking up at you or use a kissy noise or an attention noise if you've already trained that. If you're having trouble getting your puppy to make eye contact with you, I suggest checking out my attention noise video. So if I say his name Halo and he doesn't look up, I can then make my kissy noise. Oh, he's already looking at me. You ready? Halo. Good. Mark and reinforce. Halo. Cook, 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 cook. Good. For some puppies, it might be easier for them to make eye contact with you while you're standing up, but for other puppies, it might be easier for them to make eye contact with you when you're sitting down like this. Ready? Halo. Good. Halo. Good job. Step three. Practice in different situations with your puppy in different locations and positions. Halo. Good. Halo. Good. Go get it. Halo. Good. Go get it. Teaching your dog his name can be especially useful if you have multiple dogs in your household. Splash free. Good job. Good job, everyone. Tug free. Good. Wish free. Good. Good job, wishy. Here we go. Halo. Good. Wish. Kiko. Splash. Tug. This should be one of the first games you play with your new puppy. The game plan. 1. Make an attention noise and click as your puppy comes towards you, then feed your puppy in front of you. 2. Make an attention noise, then say your recall and click the puppy for running to you, then feed your puppy in front of you. Click and feed your puppy for continuing to stay with you. 3. Say your recall. Click your puppy for running to you, and then feed your puppy in front of you. Click the moment the puppy is running the fastest when she comes to you. Have one or more family members or friends sit apart from each other and take turns calling the puppy back and forth. Puppy, come! 
First, you're going to entice your puppy to run towards you, click the moment your puppy's running the fastest, and feed in front of you. Feed random treats for the puppy staying with you before the other person starts to call the puppy back. If you only give your puppy one treat for coming to you puppy in come. this game, your puppy could soon learn to just run back and forth getting treats from people and not learn the exercise of coming when called and staying with you. You can add your cue when your puppy is reliably running to you. If your puppy stops coming to you, go back a step. Make sure to feed your puppy when all four of her feet are on the floor and not on you to not reinforce jumping. By using the clicker to mark the behavior of your puppy running towards you, you're not only teaching your dog consciously to run towards you, but you're also using classical conditioning, which is creating an emotional response in the animal. By doing this, you can condition what looks like a reflexive behavior. Watch this footage of the puppy's reaction to hearing the cue come after it being paired with food only just a couple of times in this first training session. Problem solving. Try different treats. We are using boiled chicken, a tasty and healthy treat for young puppies. If the puppy is reluctant to come, run backwards, crouch, make exciting noises, pat your legs, or sit sideways. Try a less distracting location. Use a long line attached to a harness for safety, never attached to a collar. It could cause severe neck injuries. I'm just going to warm him up and get the behavior that I want, which is him running to me. So I'm just going to back up, and as he comes towards me, I'm going to click and feed. And we won't do this last time. Oh, oh, oh. And then when I get the behavior I want reliably, I can start adding the cue here. So I'm going to say, bear, here. And click him for coming. Bear, here. Good job. Here. And I don't have to feed on the ground, but it's a good way of uh, getting to be faster than your dog. Because if you feed them in their mouth, they can catch up to you really fast. Now this is the hard part that we add. It's the distraction. It's calling them away from something. Like, for example, if it was a dead rat or something, um, you want to be able to call them away. So I'm going to put the treats down there, and then I'm going to say, bear, here. Now if he wasn't... If you didn't come with me, I could um, walk backwards. There, here. Woo -hoo -hoo. Good job. And now I'm going to click him for staying with me. So he's not just darting back to the thing that he wanted. He's, he's genuinely staying with me. If it was another dog over there and I want to release him to go play again, maybe it's Bella that I'm calling him away from, I'm going to say, OK, go say hi, or OK, go get it. And then he can eat the treats. So it's not really a leave it. It depends uh, how you want to play the exercise. They could never get it, or they could get it. Maybe it's his ball. Um, maybe it's a toy. There, here. Awesome. And then try again. I mean, basically by repetition, it becomes easier for him. There, here. Awesome. Step one, back up and click your dog for running to you. Step two, add a cue like here or come and click as the dog is in motion and feed for the position. Step three, once your dog is reliably coming without distraction, add distractions. With the dog in a harness on leash, put a piece of food, a ball, or some other type of distraction down out of reach. Call your dog away from it and click your dog the moment he thinks to turn in your direction at first. Next, you can click the dog as he turns and runs towards you. Add different types of distractions. Problem solving. If the dog does not turn away from the distraction, back up so the dog is further away and try again. Do not jerk the dog away as this will not be teaching the dog to want to come to you off leash when there are distractions. We want to click the dog's choice to choose us over the distraction. Adding environmental distractions. Once your dog or puppy is reliable at coming to you in a place of no distraction or the place that you usually train, start training in other locations. Vary the distance of your recall and remember to keep training sessions very short so that your dog doesn't become too tired or too full. Work on environmental distractions and distractions such as food, 
toys, other dogs, and people separately before adding the two together. Always use the highest value of reinforcement for such an important behavior. See you next time, and don't forget to subscribe for more free training videos. So this proofing game that I'm playing with Wish, you can either play in grass, where you put low-value treats in the grass, or you can use a snuffle mat if you're working indoors, or a blanket with little folds and put low-value treats. So her kibble that she doesn't particularly like, it's a little teeny kibble here that I've sprinkled in the mat for her to find. Um, now I'm going to practice calling her away from it. So first, if you think your dog's not, or your puppy's really not going to come, you can get your puppy to move away with a treat. Wish, look. A high value treat. So I've got some really good hot dog here. And then practice the recall. Wish, come! Where she can't reach the mat at first. To give her, you know, 100% success where it's not too hard. You can also click your dog choosing to come to you <clears throat> during the game. So if your dog thinks on their own to turn away and come to you, wow, that's amazing. Okay, ready? Okay, go get it. Right here. Where are the treats? So now I'm going to let her snuffle for those treats, and I have really high value treats. So if you can't find a low value treat, maybe you can use bits of carrot or something that the dog doesn't really like. There we go. Now I'm going to call her. Wish, come! Bop, 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 yeah! Good job. I'm not going to let her go back until I give her the release. Okay, go get it. Wish, come! Awesome! Good girl. Good girl. I keep dropping treats. Wish. Good girl. Okay, go sniff. Try it off leash and with distance because I worked with her quite a quite a lot. She knows I'm gonna call her. Wish come. Awesome, good girl. And I don't particularly care about sitting. Oh, wish. I didn't want to release her yet, but I'm talking. So I don't particularly care if the dog's not sitting. When they come to me, I'd rather just feed the dog for standing, and then if you want to have a sit, then feed your, your puppy for coming to you, and then sit, ask them to sit. Good girl. Sit. Good girl. But I personally, I don't have any, you know, I'm moving around usually, so I don't specifically want my dog to come and sit with me. I'd rather she come and just settle, or just stand and hang out with me. Are you ready? Okay, go sniff. Not you, Splashers. <laughs> Go sniff, Wish. Splash free. Splash down. Wish, go sniff. Now I put hot dogs in there. And let's see if she can come away from eating the hot dogs. So if she couldn't, I could put her back on leash. Wish, come! So if she doesn't, I'm going to show her what I have. Click and treat, and then release her. Okay, get it! Wish, come! Awesome! Okay, go get it. So I'm actually calling her away from the same treats that I have right now. And I'm using my voice and my movement to get her excited about me. I have, you know, a, a faster rate of reinforcement than this mat because she has to look for it. And when she comes to me, she gets treat, treat, treat. Splash, go sniff. Now I'm going to try with, <laughs> with another dog competing for treats. Now if you have a guarding dog or a puppy, this is not a good game to play. But I figure it will make it harder for her because she might want to stick around to make sure she gets all the treats. Wish, come! Good girl! Okay, go sniff. Wish, come! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Now I'm going to try from a distance again. And I worked on the recall, so um, it's been... I've had her for... Uh, 10 weeks, is it? Yeah, 10 weeks. 
So the recall is really strong and highly reinforced. If you had just started working on the recall, this is not a good exercise because you really want to build the recall to have this extremely high reinforcement history before you start making it difficult. Push, go sniff, push free, go sniff. Um, I also trained her to, you know, leave dogs alone while they're eating, so it's kind of a little bit, she doesn't want to interfere with Splash eating. So Splash sit. Push, get it. Good girl. Splash can snuffle over here. Push, come! Yes! What a good girl! Click and treat, click and treat, multiple treats, so she doesn't just run back. And then I'm going to send her. Okay, go sniff. Go on, go on. Get your cheeks. Good girl. Now the test is if I can get Splash to come to me while she's so distracted because she's like, Woo. I'm not even training, I'm eating treats. Splash come. Yeah. <laughs> and if your other, if your puppy comes when you call your adult dog um, and there's lots of distraction, I would feed him. Splash. Okay, go sniff. Go sniff. Now I'm going to sprinkle just treats in the grass. Running out of treats. Oh, hi! If your dog chooses you over eating treats in the grass, that's also something you can click. And now I have to stop because I've run out of the high value treats and all I have is kibble left, so. Good girl. Okay, go sniff. I have a couple left. Go sniff. See if I can get both of them. Look, treats! What that? What day? Wish come! Splash come! Yes! Good job! I know it was hard. Now your favorite behavior splashers. Go sniff! Go get the treats in the grass. Go on! Splash loves getting treats out of the grass. Go on! And uh, Wish likes the frisbee, don't you? You prefer this, huh? This video is about solving and managing puppy mouthing and biting, as well as teaching the puppy to be calm, confident, and relaxed when handled. Because most puppies, when you reach for them and pet them excitedly, or even just pet them calmly, it can make the puppy aroused and also want to mouth at your hands or your clothes. Now, puppies are very similar to human toddlers in that they're exploring the world using their mouth. Now, most toddlers use their hands, but they also will put things into their mouths. And when a puppy sees things, they're naturally going to want to try putting that thing into their mouth. So if you reach for your puppy and you're touching your puppy, the puppy wants to naturally do the same back to you, but they're going to be using their mouth. So we need to train the puppies that when we reach and touch them, it's not a game of mouthing. It's simply that we're petting the dog in order to calm them down or just interact with them in a calm manner. If your puppy started to bite at your hands like this, I suggest getting your puppy's attention, pop, 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 and then say, oh my goodness, look, what is that? and point out a toy that already exists in the environment. So don't get a toy out of a new place, like on top of a, a counter and give your puppy a toy, because they could quickly learn they can get your attention by biting you to get access to toys they don't have. But I suggest having some cool toys around that you interact with often that the puppy likes, and then get your puppy to play with those toys and interact with those toys when he's feeling like checking things out in the environment with his mouth or chewing on things. When you first bring your puppy home, you want to really create a reinforcement history for playing with his toys right from the start. Don't just leave the toys out and hope he'll choose those over your socks and shoes or better yet, pick up your socks and shoes so your puppy is more likely to spend the day playing with his toys that you want him to play with rather than your stuff or your clothes, your hair, and your hands. So as you can see, this pup really enjoys playing with his toys. Managing and preventing mouthing and biting. Pet and handle your puppy calmly and gently. Instead of petting your puppy excitedly, play with a toy with your puppy. Write a list of the times your puppy bites and avoid putting your puppy in those situations unless you plan to train your puppy. 
If your puppy becomes overexcited and mouthy, you can put him in his pen where he can play with his toys. We can teach puppies what to do when being petted, handled, and groomed by setting up short training sessions. You can use a portion of your puppy's breakfast and dinner to work on handling exercises, and I suggest working on them daily when you first get your puppy. Step 1. Touch and feed a treat at the same time. The reason that you want to feed and touch at the same time is that if you have a mouthy puppy and you just reach for your puppy, your puppy might either lick or bite at your hand as you're reaching for your puppy, or if you have a timid puppy, you reach for your puppy and your puppy might back away, and that's not the first thing you want your puppy to do when you reach for them in a training session. So I suggest starting out every training session by feeding and touching at the same time. So if you're going to be touching your puppy's feet, you touch and feed at the same time, practice touching the top of the head, and you're doing this all calmly so the puppy isn't finding it overwhelming at first. So now I'm touching on the back of his shoulders like this and feeding. And then once you've done that and your puppy is seeming pretty contented to get his treat while you touch him at the same time, you can move on to the next step, which is making the petting the predictor of food. Because at the first step, you're simply teaching him what's going to happen to him while he's not doing anything. And then the second step is teaching him that the actual petting is what predicts that the food is going to come. Step two, touch your puppy, say good or click, and then move to feed a treat. So I'm going to touch him, say good, and then give him a treat. Good. 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 Once your puppy is calm and relaxed with you placing your hand on your puppy, you can also practice good. stroking gestures. Good. Step three, add duration to the handling and teach the puppy to ignore the treats. The third step you might not actually get to in the first few training sessions because it requires a couple of other skills to be taught to the puppy. One, either that the puppy can look away from treats that you're holding, like that, good or that your puppy can offer you eye contact or at least look up at you when you make a kissy noise or an attention noise. Good, like that. And I did not know that he would do all that so perfectly. You're so clever. Okay, so after doing step two where you reach, mark, good, and then feed, you can start to wait until your puppy offers you eye contact or doesn't look at the treats because you don't want your puppy to only think that handling is okay if he's looking at food because when the food becomes out of the picture, then suddenly you might get the mouthing and biting or overexcitement with handling again. Good. So you reach, touch your puppy calmly, and wait for your puppy to stop looking at the food or look up at your eyes. And if that doesn't happen within two to three seconds, you can make your attention noise or say your puppy's name if that's his cue to look at you. Good. Now, when I make my attention noise and my puppy doesn't look, I make a little blowing noise, like a breathing noise, like that. Good. And then I mark it and then go to feed a treat. You want to make sure when you mark your puppy for calm behaviors like handling that you don't race to get that treat into the picture because what you can create is a puppy that's getting excited about the treat coming. So you want to mark, pause, and then feed the treat. Step four, keep changing the picture. Practice these handling exercises while the puppy is sitting, standing, laying down, as well as while you're standing above the puppy or to the side of the puppy. It's really important that during this training you handle your puppy calmly. However, you should do some training sessions where you simulate what other people might do to your puppy before you can tell the person that that's not an appropriate way to pet a puppy. Good. If your puppy opens his mouth, gets excited, leans away or backs away, go back to step one where you touch and feed at the same time. If your puppy is still too excited, then stop training and wait until another time to train when he is calm. 
Here you can see my puppy ducks when I tried to touch him on the head, so I go back to step one of touching and feeding at the same time. If you have a puppy that leans away or backs away from you when you try to touch him, you can play this game as the first step where you move away from your puppy, and to reach the treat, the puppy's face rubs against your hand to get the treat in your hand. So you can hold your hand under his chin as he reaches for the treat, or have your hand above his head. Then you can turn it into a petting gesture and start to pet him before you give him the treat. Today I'm going to be talking about how to teach your puppy not to mouth or bite at your clothing, accessories, or your hair. Good puppy. What I've already worked on with this pup, I've only had him a few days, is working on a calm settle for food, which he's doing right now so I can talk to you. Now, naturally, when I train dogs, I never want to let them rehearse the undesirable behavior. So, in my videos, you'll never see the dogs doing the things that they're not supposed to do. I only show you the small approximations of how to train the dog what you do want them to do. But in this case, because I get a lot of requests of people saying, hey, how come you're never using untrained dogs? It's because when you train with positive reinforcement, it always looks like the dog is already trained because you're breaking the steps up small enough that the dog can succeed every step of the way. So this puppy has never had any training with mouthing and biting, and I will show you that my puppy does mouth and bite at clothing when it moves around, but it's not very good training to do this. On this rare occasion, I will show the dog rehearsing the undesirable behavior. This is because the behavior of tugging is one I do want for when playing with tug toys in the future. Also, showing this specific undesirable behavior is not stressful for this dog. Seeing what the dog does in a situation before training actually makes the dog more likely to do those behaviors in the future. Instead, a smarter training plan is training in small, easily achievable steps where the dog doesn't even have a thought to do the undesirable behavior again. As you can see, this is a normal puppy. Puppies naturally want to grab at anything that moves fast or is dangling, like a dress or your hair or some jewelry or this dishcloth or a sweater sleeve as you're putting it on. So this is a normal puppy, but you'll see during the training, the puppy is not going to be doing this type of behavior. The point of this exercise is to teach the puppy that when things are dangling around, it means to ignore them, and you can still play tug with your dog, but it's really important to put that on a verbal cue like get it, and always say get it before you offer your dog a toy to tug on, so they don't get the wrong idea that anything that's dangling in their face is fair game to be tugged on. In this exercise, you can either use a clicker or a verbal marker, so you can either click and then feed a treat or I have a nice calm marker, good. That means I'm gonna slowly deliver the treat to the puppy like that. The game is pretty simple. You start off with distractions that are very easy for the puppy to ignore. So with this sweater, for example, if the puppy's over here settling, or you could have your puppy on a leash and you could have a helper, the helper's just going to show the sweater and move it slowly, and as you move it, you mark and then feed a treat. So the puppy is associating that when the sweater moves and they stay still, they get a click and a treat. And basically you're training the puppy to do nothing when they see this happen. Good job. When your puppy is having success, you can start to make things more exciting. So I'm gonna move the sweater past the puppy like this. Good. Good job. I'm going to dangle my sleeve. Good job. Good boy. Once your puppy has mastered settling with the distractions, you can now practice when you and your puppy are standing up and moving, which is harder for most puppies, so you'll need to go back to marking the moment the distraction happens at first to set your puppy up for success. Good. 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 Good job. Good. Good. Good boy. 
Good job. When your puppy looks calm and can easily ignore the distraction, you can increase how long you make the distraction happen before you mark. You can also increase the difficulty of the distraction. Most puppies find fast, erratic movement harder to resist than slow, predictable movement. Good. Good. If you have a puppy that's extremely excited about grabbing moving things, you can feed the treat as you move the thing at first. So I'm moving this thing and feeding the puppy like that. Good job. And now I'm going to do the leash first and then mark and feed. Good. 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 If your puppy were to grab onto whatever it is that you're working with, put a high value treat to your dog's nose and then start over by making it much less arousing. Good. Also, I have a video on how to train the cue drop so that you can teach your puppy to let go of things that they start to pick up or they're tugging on. You can also use a kissy noise or the recall if you see your puppy going over to someone else to pull on their shoelaces or to get their clothing. You can make your kissy noise, attention noise, um, or call your puppy to you so that your puppy isn't practicing that behavior. When you see your puppy get interested in something, like someone's shuffling feet or shoelaces, interrupt your puppy and redirect him to something you do want him to be doing, like playing with his toys. Then make a mental note to work on that specific distraction in a training session. Good job. Here's a list of the steps. Step 1. Mark as the distraction happens. Step 2. Mark after the distraction begins. Step 3. Add more time before you mark. Step 4. Add difficulty and variety to the training. For the most successful training, you want to work on the distractions before the puppy is exposed to them in real life. For example, having your kids move in front of your puppy for the first time in a training session and reinforcing your puppy for remaining calm as it happens, beginning first by having the kids simply walking past your puppy. I'm just going to work on the behavior of a default leave it from the hand because as you can see what this dog is doing, he thinks I might give him the treat um, because I'm holding treats, which is a normal um, thought for a dog. But actually, I'm going to click and reinforce the times when he's not trying to get the treat on his own. So the absence of trying to get the treat gets the treat. Click and reinforce your dog for backing away. So you can practice no mugging from your hand as well as your bait bag and that's going to save you a lot of time down the road when you're training and your dog suddenly thinks, ooh, I think I shall take that treat. Good job. Click your dog for staying away from the treats. Once you click and reinforce your dog for backing away, click and reinforce your dog for staying back. Add eye contact or click your dog for looking in a different direction than at the treats. Once you've reinforced your dog for backing away from the treats, you can now ask for eye contact or looking away from the treats. So anytime the dog looks at your eyes or looks away from the treats in your hand or bait bag, you can click and reinforce. Here you can see I'm helping the dog out by making a noise with my mouth to get the dog to look at my face so I can click and reinforce. Hold out two fingers and click as your dog goes to sniff your two fingers. Dogs will naturally want to sniff your hand if you outreach it towards them. Make sure you're clicking the precise moment that the dog's nose is touching your two fingers because if you're too quick or you're too slow with the click, you're actually clicking your dog for not touching your fingers. So make sure that your timing is precise. You also want to make a very clear hand gesture so your dog is learning to only touch your hand when it's in the certain gesture and not all the time.
This is Rilo, a nine week old puppy's first clicker training lesson. And you can see on this next touch that he gets so excited he does a little spin when he figures out that touching the hand means that he'll get a treat. Keep raising criteria. Try the hand gesture in different positions and from different distances away from your dog. If your dog's succeeding, keep making it harder. And if your dog's failing, make it easier. If you're having trouble trying to get your dog to touch your hand, try moving your hand away from your dog or hiding your hand and then representing it again. You can also try getting up and walking away and clicking as your dog just comes towards you. If your dog is licking or nipping at your fingers, click just before they reach your fingers. You want to add the verbal cue when your dog is reliably touching your fingers every time you hold them out. To do this, you simply say the word touch before you reach out your hand. Good job. Touch. Good girl. Touch is a wonderful behavior for many reasons. One, it's a great exercise for shy dogs to build confidence with interacting with people and being handled. It's also a great way to teach your dog to come. Here's a game you can play after you add the verbal cue. All you have to do is throw the treat away from you after the dog's touched your hand and you've clicked to reset your dog to come running towards you from different directions. Make sure to do this exercise on carpet or flat ground if your dog is having trouble finding the treats in the grass. Here's another game you can play. Can your dog touch your fingers when you hold them on the ground? Can your dog touch your fingers when you hold your fingers slightly above their head? Can your dog touch your fingers when you hold them in any location? Here's another great game to play. Can your dog leave the treats in your hand to touch your fingers? The cue touch is a great tool for training new behaviors and tricks. You can teach your dog to follow your hand as a lure when you're showing him the touch signal. To do this, show your dog your touch signal and move your hand slightly. Click for your dog following your hand for one second. Then increase criteria so your dog follows your fingers for longer and longer periods of time. Step one, toss a treat in the bed. So the first step is throwing a treat into the bed and clicking your puppy for going to eat the treat. As, they, as you click, you want to then feed the treats in the bed. So the bed is this huge reinforcement zone. Good job. And you can give her a release cue like free and click your puppy for coming away from the bed. Ready? Good boy. Awesome. Free. Good job. Step two. Pretend to throw a treat. So... After repeating this step of throwing a treat in and clicking your puppy for going to eat it, you can then go on to the next step, which is pretending to throw a treat in. And once you pretend to throw a treat in, you click your puppy for going towards the bed or into the bed, and then they still get the treat. So you click steps towards it, or a step into the bed, and then throw the treat. Good job! So here you can see he's not putting his feet in the bed, so I might just wait and see if he might go to sniff inside the bed and by mistake put his foot in the bed. Then I can feed multiple treats for being on the bed. It's easier if you have a bigger bed. If you have a very small bed that they have to curl up in, they might be less successful with this exercise. So the bigger the target zone, the easier the exercise is. Right? Okay, so if your fake treat isn't working anymore, so they go back to the step of throwing the treat into the bed. You must be. Good boy. Step three, wait and see if the dog thinks to go to the bed. So after playing this game a couple of times, you can see if your dog might think to go in the bed on their own. So just a step towards the bed equals a click and a treat. Ready? Good boy. And I'm going to feed him the treat in the bed. Ready? Almost straight.
Step four, add a cue. Now, I'm pretty sure this time that he's going to go right into the bed, so that's when you add your cue, when you know your puppy's going to head on over there and go in their bed. So, who must free? I wasn't quite sure he might do it, so I didn't say the cue. This time, free. I'm going to say, go in your bed. Good boy. Awesome. So, um, some puppies, some dogs might not think to lay down when they go in their bed. So, you can actually, once they've gone in there, lure them into the down position with a treat and give them the treat as an added step. Free. So they've gone in their bed, and then you lure them into the down position. Move your hand away, click, and give them the treat. And then keep reinforcing them for staying in the down position. Step five, proof the behavior. Now you can practice proofing it from different parts of the room. Ready? Go in your bed. Good boy. Awesome job! And you don't always want to give them a treat as soon as they get in the bed once they've learned it because then if you don't, then they get frustrated and say, hey, where's my treat? So to proof the stay in the bed while other things are happening, you need to do a whole bunch of different distractions and if your puppy gets out of the bed, if they don't quickly run back in, you can simply quickly lure them back to the bed into the down position and then make the distraction easier. So Kiko, bite your tail. Yes. So go in your bed. I'm simply going to take a step away from him. Yes. 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 Almost free. Yes. You also want to remember to mark the, the release cue. So if your puppy gets up out of the bed, you want to say yes and feed them a treat. If your puppy doesn't get up, encourage them to get up. So you say the release cue, free, and if your puppy doesn't get up, you encourage them. Bye -bye, puppy. Yes, good boy. I'll see you up. Step six, combine the behavior with a settle. So the next step to this is teaching the puppy to settle in the bed. And I have a tutorial on how to teach the settle. But basically, you have the bed next to you, and you work on a settle, and you can see the link to the video if you look down in the description. Um, so, basically, you wait until your puppy's not thinking about the food, and then you reinforce them. It makes it easier to teach your puppy to go in his crate or pen and relax or lay down if you've already worked on a settle with your puppy like my puppy's doing here or if you've also worked on teaching your puppy to go to his bed and relax on his bed. Now I'm going to put the bed inside the pen that he hasn't worked with yet. Now I've worked with a crate with him before but this is a new pen that we've just got and I want to teach him that it's the same concept so putting the bed in there really helps. Step one, throw a treat into the crate. The first step is throwing a treat into the pen, clicking and reinforcing your puppy for going into the pen or crate, and then continuing to click and reinforce your puppy for staying in there. You might have to click quite quickly or say yes quite qu quickly and throw a treat in there to keep your puppy in there. If your puppy thinks to come out, just let him. And if you see that your puppy doesn't want to go into the crate or pen to get the treat, that means he has some concern about it. So one thing you can do is take the top off the crate if it's one of those plastic crates, or take the top of the pen, or simply work on the bed more before putting the bed into the crate, because that will give your puppy more confidence about going into the small space that he's unsure about. What you don't want to do is block your puppy from coming out, because that can teach the puppy that once he's in there, he might get trapped by you, and it might make him more concerned about going in. So just let your puppy come out, and let him build his confidence on his own about going in. Are you ready? Puppy free. Good job. Mark and feed your puppy for staying in the pen for 15 to 30 seconds, and then use a release cue like free or release to mean they can come out. So I'm going to say free, and if he doesn't think to come out, I could lure him out or make a pop, 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 a little enticing noise to get him to come out, and then I'm going to mark and feed him a treat for listening to come out of his pen. Step two, pretend to throw a treat into the crate. After repeating step one multiple times, you can then pretend to throw a treat into the crate 
And as the puppy goes in to look for the treat, mark and then give him multiple treats, clicks and treats, for staying in the crate. Good job. If your puppy doesn't think to lay down, you can lure your puppy into the down position. Freak, get it? By just holding a treat down like this or working on the down behavior before you add them together. The first few times that you pretend to throw a treat into the crate, on the next time that you repeat the behavior, I suggest actually throwing a treat because puppies are extremely smart and they'll quickly figure out that you didn't actually throw a treat in, so they won't go in as you pretend to throw the treat. So if that happens, you can do other techniques like putting the treat in through the back of the crate or dropping the treat in from the top. Good job. Halo free, good job. If at any time your puppy offers going into the crate on his own, mark it and reinforce it because it's a wonderful behavior for a puppy to offer. If you're training something else where maybe you're teaching your dog to paw at you, if they offer that without you asking, then it's a big deal. But if it's something calm and wonderful like going into the crate and laying down, I would just mark and reinforce the puppy offering without even being asked. Step three, turn the throwing gesture into a hand signal. The next step is turning the throwing gesture into a pointing gesture. Are you ready? So I'm going to pretend like I'm throwing, but I have a pointing finger, and I'm going to click and reinforce him for going in there. Good job. Once your puppy is reliably responding to the pointing gesture, you can add your verbal cue. So you can say, go in your crate, or go to bed, or whatever it is, just before you then point at the crate. Are you ready? So I'm going to say, go in your crate, and then I'm going to point, click, and reinforce. Step four, add a verbal cue. It's not necessary to phase out the hand signal, but if you wanted to do that, you can say, go in your crate and click and reinforce your puppy for going in without doing the hand signal. If at any point your puppy doesn't go in when you say go in your crate, you can revert back to pointing to mean go in the crate. Good job. Teach the puppy the door isn't the cue to come out. It's really important to teach your puppy to have the door opened and closed in training sessions rather than just seeing what might happen. So I suggest closing the door, clicking and reinforcing, or you can even reinforce through the roof so that the puppy learns that when the door is closed you can still have access inside like that. Good job. And then opening the door and marking and reinforcing the puppy for staying down. So you might want to feed the treats low like this so that the puppy stays in the down position while in there rather than thinking to pop up when the door opens. By teaching the puppy that the door isn't the signal to come out but your release cue, Halo Free, then you have a puppy that when you open the door, they're not struggling to get out of the door as you're opening it, which can end in some frustration behaviors. Hey, Pupsy. In this tutorial, I'm going to teach you how to teach a really important safety behavior to your puppy or your adult dog. Basically, when you reach for a dog to grab their collar or grab their harness, a lot of dogs find that really intimidating and scary. So we can actually train them to enjoy finding having their collar grabbed or their harness grabbed a really reinforcing experience so that in an emergency, if you need to catch your dog while he's loose and frightened and maybe hurt, or if a neighbor or a stranger is going to catch your dog, they're not going to find it this strange, intimidating experience to suddenly be grabbed. A lot of dogs don't like having their collar grabbed. It either makes them overexcited, mouthy, or makes them want to scuttle away. By repeating this exercise over and over again, you will condition a new emotional response in your dog to love having his collar grabbed. Step one, reach, say yes, then feed. So the first step is simply reaching towards the puppy or the dog and marking with a verbal marker like the word yes. So I'm gonna reach, yes, and then feed the treat. Yes, good boy. And I can do it from standing up too, yes. If you have a very shy dog or puppy, you can stand to the side of the puppy and reach from the side as, at, at first, so they're not feeling intimidated by you. Yes. Yes. If your puppy's doing great, you can start reaching from the top and from the front. Yes. 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 
Step two, touch the color, say yes, then feed. The next step is touching the puppy's color. Yes, so as you touch the collar, say yes, and then move to give a treat. If you do it both at the same time, the puppy could not, might not be understanding that it's the touching of the collar that's meaning the treat is coming, but just your hand moving. So you don't want to teach your puppy to love your hand moving to give him a treat, you want to teach him that it's all about the collar. Yes, that means the treat is coming. If your puppy is really mouthy or bitey, and you, you can't even get your hand near their collar without them biting you, then you can first start out this game by feeding and then touching. What you will be doing is showing your dog what you're about to do without giving them a chance to get mouthy or frightened. When your dog becomes comfortable with this exercise, then move on to reaching first and grabbing before saying yes and then feeding. Yes. Yes. Try it in all different types of scenarios. So, Blue Moss has been laying down while I reach to touch his collar, and I've been reaching with my left hand and doing the same gesture. Change it up. So now I'm going to move over here. Yes. And grab him with my right hand. Yes. Good boy. Yes. Awesome. This is teaching your dog to trust you. So even if you think your dog might be okay with having his collar grabbed, you want him to really love it and enjoy it and really trust you that when you're grabbing his collar it's all about your connection with him and you and it's got nothing to do with you trying to intimidate your dog. Hey Splash. Step 3. Teach your puppy to feel comfortable being led by the collar. Another thing you can teach your dog is to be led by their collar. So even though I don't use a collar to walk my dog on because I'm worried about it damaging their neck, at some point in their life, they might actually have their collar grabbed and had, have someone lead them by their collar, say if they got loose. So it's an, a really important safety behavior. So I'm going to teach that to Lumos right now. I'm going to grab his collar, and then I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on it um, towards me. Yes, and I'm going to mark the moment that he moves towards me. If your puppy's really scared of you touching their collar, you can simply pull on it a little bit yes and say yes as they feel a little bit of pressure on their neck yes good boy yes awesome he's doing too good <laughs> yes so say for example i don't know he's really nervous or frightened he's loose he doesn't have his harness on in the street i need to get him i'm going to get his collar yes and lead him away without him making him more scared if your dog looks nervous or unhappy when you pull forwards on his collar, you can use food to lure him forwards and teach him what you want him to do first. Then, when he is comfortable, you can practice without the food. Yes. If your puppy looks fearful, backs away, or becomes mouthy, go back a step to either just reaching or feeding and touching at the same time. If you have an aggressive dog, a dog that has bitten, or a dog that does not like being touched, get help from a professional trainer first. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how I do a puppy restraint. Now, it's very important that you don't do this with an adult dog, especially a dog that's scared or aggressive, because you could go too fast, too quickly, and there is the potential for scaring the dog or making the dog bite you. So it's really important to teach the puppy to be restrained because as an adult, if the dog has to go to the vet and needs to be restrained for shots or has an injury, and you know you have to restrain your dog while they're getting medical care, uh, it's really important that the dog finds it calm and relaxing rather than very scary in the moment that he needs to be restrained. So the way that I like to teach this behavior is in small steps, small successful steps, so you're not scaring the puppy, any time along the way. Step one, build calm confidence when touched on different parts of the body. First you're just working on touching your puppy, yeah, and using a calm marker and calm treat delivery. So what do I mean by that? Well, you're bringing the treats to the puppy very slowly, and you want to also start training when the puppy's sleepy and not very excited, yeah. So you touch the puppy, yeah, 
and then you give the puppy a treat. Awesome. Yep. Good job. Okay. So you want to do it when your puppy's laying down, but also standing up. Because what can happen is if they're standing up and you reach and try to touch your puppy, and they back away, get it. Yep. And you know you're going too far too quickly. Make the game easier if your puppy gets overexcited, mouths your hand, or backs away. If you have a shy puppy, check out my video, Handling Shyness. And if you have a mouthy puppy, check out my video on how to stop your puppy mouthing and biting. Move on to step two once your puppy is comfortable with being touched. Step two, restrain and reinforce. I like to lure the puppy between my legs and then put my hand against the puppy's chest. Mark and feed. This way, if your puppy doesn't like your hand on his chest, he can back up. Once it's successful, you can sit down and restrain your puppy. In the beginning, you want to use a high rate of reinforcement. So you mark and feed immediately as you begin restraining your puppy and every few seconds. Don't mark if your puppy starts whining or struggling. Instead, walk away from your puppy and see if your puppy wants to join you. Then work on the exercise in step one. Step three, increase duration and use calm massage. Increase the amount of time between when you mark and feed. You can use calm massage as well as breathing deeply and sighing to help calm your puppy down. Step four, vary how you restrain the puppy. You want to vary the restraints. So restrain your dog in a sit, restrain your dog while standing, restrain your dog while you're cradling him, and see if you can restrain your dog upside down. Most dogs hate being upside down, but it's necessary for them to be restrained upside down in certain circumstances, at the vet, for example, and for grooming, it's really nice if your dog is comfortable upside down, so you can see what's going on on the underside of them. I'm going to lift her up, yep, and mark as I lift, and then feed. Now, if she finds it very aversive, I can simply start just squeezing her, yep, while her feet are still on the ground. Yep. So when I made her like this, she didn't like it at all. I'm just going to let her get up. If at any point your puppy panics or gets overexcited, I suggest taking it back a step to just touching, yep, and feeding so your dog is confident and happy to have your hands on him. Step five, add distractions. Once your puppy is really relaxed and calm with being restrained, when there are no distractions, you can start to add distractions. So for example, um, if you were in the park and you were holding your puppy and you saw a squirrel or another dog, he might want to escape you and run towards the dog and that would make him frustrated. So I'm going to put a little distraction of treats down here, yep, and then I'm going to say yep, and feed my dog for understanding the concept of yep, you can't get those treats right now because I'm holding you. Now if your puppy struggles and squirms, you can put the treats further away or use a distraction that's less exciting. So maybe there's some kibble far away and you're feeding your dog hot dogs or cheese. Yep, for having the impulse control to not just squirm to go and get what he wants. So this is a great exercise for dogs that are impulsive and they can't control their impulses. 
idea is that you want your dog to understand that the best place to be is here, being restrained with you. Yeah? Ready? Okay. And then you can release your dog to go and get the treats. Go get him. Come on. Yeah, right there. Here's a quick way to teach your young puppy to play fetch. Now this is a very useful skill to teach a young puppy because if they steal your socks or something like that, for example, you can get your puppy to fetch it to you and drop it. First you get your puppy interested in the toy, then you throw it, and when you see your puppy has the toy in their mouth, you make a kissy noise or go pop, 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 and go the other way. And most young puppies will forget to let go of the toy when they go towards you, so they'll carry the toy towards you. And if you have two toys, you can then play with the puppy with the other toy. Wait until the puppy has the toy in his mouth before making enticing noises or moving away from your puppy to entice him to move towards you. Puppy! When your puppy gets to you, you can gently play tug with your puppy and then drop the toy and show your puppy the other toy and move it around until your puppy drops the toy he has in his mouth. You might want to use a bigger or longer toy than I'm using here if you think your puppy might go for your hands while you're jiggling the toy around. Good job, good job, yeah, 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 oh boy. Puppies shouldn't really play fetch until they are adults and their growth plates have closed because of the jolting movement that happens when the dog gets to the toy. Fetch also needs to be limited in adult dogs to prevent injury. That said, I like to train fetch to young puppies as one of the first behaviors that they learn while they still have the tendency to want to hold on to the toy in their mouth when they're called. I suggest throwing the toy three to five times to teach the concept in a couple of training sessions, and then when the puppy is great at fetching, you can then play games that don't involve jumping or jolting movements, for example, teaching the puppy to put his toys away, or having the puppy chase you with a toy in his mouth to then play tug with you. Yeah, good job, you got it, you got it. Professional dog trainers and performers who have injury prevention and the health of their dog in mind always choose to train and perform and play with their dogs on a non-slip surface. This is because if you work on a slippery surface, it's like when you're on ice and you slip a little bit, that happens to dogs and it's really hard to avoid. So the best solution is, yes, train your dog to be confident when they walk on slippery surfaces, but when you play and train with your dogs, train and play on a non-slip surface like a carpet or grass outside. Some carpets and mats are actually slippery, so you need to check and make sure you don't just have a carpet that's slippery. You want to make sure your dog's not slipping when they're moving around. It's also really important with adult dogs when you're working on jumping and jolting movements like agility and stuff like that, you want to be working on a padded surface like um, some dog training arenas have a padded mat that the dogs perform and train on, or grass is the best surface for doing jumping movements. I don't suggest having your dog jumping in the house high on a carpet like this because there's just not enough padding. Conversely, sand is also not a good thing to perform jumping and jolting movements because it's too giving. So I suggest investing in a training surface for your puppy or adult dog. If you're not gonna be doing jumping tricks and stuff like that and working on stuff inside, I like to have an area rug like this for my puppy training. And yes, it's harder to clean uh, with a puppy, but you can get a cheap one and then just throw it away and get another one. Um, it's also really important for my puppy here because he likes to play a lot in the evening and this is the point of space for him to play in and he won't go and venture onto the hardwood floor to play with his toys. He sticks to the carpet because it's non-slip and that's really going to help him grow properly and not get any early injuries from slipping. Today I'm going to show you how to train the cue drop. Now, if your dog's not interested in toys, I have another video on how to train drop using your dog's chew stick, and I'll link that in the description below. This is a very simple technique for training drop, and I find it highly effective. First, you have to get the dog interested in playing with the toy. So this might take a little bit of time if you have treats out and your dog thinks that he's gonna get treats. So you might wanna wave the toy around. You might spend a few minutes getting your dog invested in that toy. 
Once your dog's invested in tugging on the toy, hold a treat to your dog's nose, and when your dog lets go, give them the treat. Then you want to cue your dog to get the toy, so you can say get it or whatever you want, but be careful because your dog might get your hand, so you might want to use a bigger toy than I'm using here if you have a dog that might go for your hand instead of the toy. Are you ready? Get it. So you say get it first and then move the toy around. You want to make sure your dog's really invested in tugging on that toy, but not too excited that he might be not wanting to let go of the toy for the treat. If your dog doesn't let go of the toy for the treat, you need to use a lower value toy or a higher value treat to play the game and maybe be less exciting about tugging on the toy. So once you've played the game where you put the treat up towards your dog's nose and he drops the fr frisbee or the toy reliably, then you can start to add your cue. So you're just going to say your cue, drop, and then put the treat to your dog's nose. Ready? Get it! It might take a couple of training sessions to get to the next step, but the next step is saying drop, good, marking, and then moving your hand to feed the treat. Drop, good. You can mark and feed multiple good. times before cueing get it to teach your dog to wait for the cue. You can also add eye contact if your dog knows to look at you. Good. Get it. What's this? Get it. Good boy. Drop. Good. Good boy. Good. Ready? Good. This video is an exercise to play with young puppies to prevent toy guarding. Now I'm going to continue to make videos of different exercises to prevent resource guarding in young puppies. These exercises are not meant as a plan for a puppy with severe fear issues and severe resource guarding, and these are not exercises to play with adult dogs that have severe resource guarding issues, because what's needed for these two different topics, uh, severe resource guarding in puppies and adult dogs, is a personal plan for that specific dog rather than just following the video, because if you go too fast, too quickly, you could actually do more damage than good. So what you need to do is find a professional dog trainer who uses only positive reinforcement and counter conditioning to solve the problem and get advice to let them help you through the problem. Toy guarding prevention exercise for puppies. In this footage, this nine-week-old puppy is not very happy about having a hand reach towards the toy that he's playing with, without any previous training. Step one, give your puppy a low-value toy. If your puppy's not interested in the toy, you can play with your puppy to get him interested in the toy again. Step two, walk towards your puppy, drop a high-value treat next to him, and walk away. The point of this simple exercise is to use counter conditioning to change the puppy's emotional response to an approaching human when he's playing with his toy. Practice approaching and dropping treats from different angles. What you should be seeing after a couple of repetitions is that your puppy happily drops the toy and looks at you expectantly when you walk towards him when he's playing with the toy. If this isn't happening, here are some things you can try. Use a higher value treat like real meat or cheese. Use a lower value toy or something that isn't even a toy. Toss the treats towards the puppy from a distance at first. Practice the step of approaching and dropping a treat in multiple training sessions using different toys. First, starting with low value toys and then moving to the toys your puppy likes the best. Step three. Reach towards the toy, say yes as you reach, then feed a treat. Yeah. Step four, reach and touch the toy, say yes as you touch it, then feed a treat. Step five, say yes as you pick up the toy, then feed a treat, and then give the toy back. Yes. 
Here's footage of before the training session slowed down. As a hand reaches towards the puppy, the puppy gets very tense. After the first training session of just a couple of minutes, you can see this puppy's behavior has changed drastically. In my opinion, this exercise is a great way to prevent behavioral problems down the line, as well as a great trust building exercise. Something pretty amazing happened at the end of this specific training session. Lumos, the border collie puppy, who usually wanted to play keep away with a ball, fetched the ball to the handler for the very first time. Great behaviors to teach your new puppy to help prevent guarding issues are drop it, leave it, eye contact, and bring it. Some dogs have a tendency to guard and others don't. If you have a puppy with a tendency to guard, remember that it can be more likely to happen when the dog is in a new situation or stressed. A dog with guarding issues needs to have a management and prevention program in place to prevent guarding in the future. Seek professional help if needed. A great book on guarding is Mine by Jean Donaldson. This exercise is not meant for puppies with resource guarding issues or adult dogs who guard. Step 1. Hold a low value chew for your puppy to chew. Present a high value treat to the puppy, then give the chew back. Step 2. If your puppy is reliably dropping the chew for the food, you can say drop before you move to give your puppy a treat. Drop? Get it. Drop. Oh. Step 3. Ask your puppy to drop the chew. Say yes, good boy, or click as he drops it. Then feed a treat. Drop? Yes. If your puppy doesn't drop the chew after you say the cue, either make an attention noise or simply put the food on his nose. If he still won't drop it, it means that you need to use higher value treats and a less valuable chew. Drop? Yes. You must. Drop? And then present the treat. If your puppy loses interest in the chew, play with the chew to make it more exciting. Get it. Drop. Good boy. Step four. When your puppy starts spitting out the chew when you say drop, you can try this exercise with your puppy holding the chew on his own. Drop! Yes! Good boy. Okay, get it. Get it. It's important to build the drop behavior to be very strong using low value chews first before continuing to higher value chews. Leo, drop. Good job. If you need to take a chew away from your puppy, say for example if the chew got too short, ask your puppy to drop the chew, drop a handful of treats away from the chew, and then hold your puppy's harness or collar as you reach to pick the chew up so that the puppy doesn't lunge forwards and go for the chew again after finishing the treats.
you can practice this scenario in a training session and then give the chew back to your puppy so he doesn't think that every time that you drop treats means that you'll take his chew away. Did you guys want to get a chew, hmm? This video is on the topic of separation training for young puppies and adult dogs. Now, the way that I like to approach separation training is teaching the dog what I do want him to do when being left alone and leave very little room for error or variation of their behavior. So the way that I'm going to approach it is to teach the dog to think, to go and settle and take a nap in his bed. You can also, along with this training, teach your dog to play with toys on his own and chew on bones on his own and then in the pen that you leave your dog you can leave bones and chews so they can have a choice of whether they want to take a nap or play with their toys but with the initial training i like to focus on teaching the dog that when he's having time separated from you it's time to relax and take a nap this training plan of teaching the dog exactly what you do want him to do leaves little room for error and will make the dog less likely to vocalize, use his bed as a chew toy, learn to put his feet up, or try to dig and bite at the enclosure. All of these are natural behaviors a dog might offer without any training when being put behind a barrier. Oftentimes, trainers will simply put a dog in a pen and suggest ignoring the behaviors you dislike. However, this can cause an extinction burst where the dog can become frustrated, the behaviors can become more intense, and the dog's behavior and emotions can begin to vary. This is not the best plan to teach a dog to become and enjoy being left alone. The best plan is reinforcing the behaviors you do want your dog to do. Step one, reinforce a settle and calmness around food. By reinforcing a settle, and calmness around food first, it will make it easier for the dog to be calm and relaxed during the separation training. It will make it easier to add duration as well as your movement away from the dog. Without prior training, the dog might be excited, confused, or frustrated by receiving a piece of food from someone who then walks off with the food while he's behind a barrier. To train the settle and calmness around food, Wear your treat bag around the house or have treats in jars in different rooms and when you see your dog relax and settle on the floor, not thinking about the food, calmly walk over and drop a treat between your dog's paws or use a calm marker like good and then deliver the treat slowly to the dog. It might take a couple of days before your dog can truly relax around the food on the counters and the food in your bait bag, but if your dog is having trouble with this, you can use low value treats at first to do this training. You want to get to the point where you can drop a treat for your dog between his paws and move away and your dog doesn't think to pop up and follow you. You also want to make sure that your dog looks relaxed, that his muscles are relaxed and that he has a soft expression on his face. Step two, teach the dog to go to his bed and go in his crate. By teaching and reinforcing your dog for going to his bed, this will make the bed a visual cue for the dog to move toward and relax on when left alone in the future. You can work on teaching the dog to go to his bed and go in his crate as you work on step one by practicing them at different times during the day. Check out the written description below for full tutorials on how to teach your dog to go to his bed as well as how to teach your dog to go in his crate. I suggest first working on teaching your dog to go to his bed and then putting the bed inside the crate. To create clarity, I suggest having a cue to tell your dog to go into the crate as well as a cue to tell your dog when it's time to come out of the crate. All done. Good boy. Step three, add duration while next to the pen or crate. Now you can practice the settle in the bed while inside the pen or crate. If you have a pen like this one, you can sit in the pen with your dog if you have a dog that you think might whine if you're on the outside of the pen and work on the duration of the settle in the bed while in the pen. Now you can use a book or a phone to entertain yourself and when you see your dog looking relaxed and all sleepy, you can 
mark by saying good and then reinforce with a treat or simply calmly move and feed your dog a treat. And the slower you move your hand, the calmer he's going to be rather than if I say, good, here you go, boy. Yeah, good job, nice saddle. Good job. <laughs> Sorry, Halo. You can practice this exercise while in the living room, watching TV, or working on your computer. If you have a puppy that whines or barks or panics when you walk away from them while they're in a pen, I suggest setting up the pen and sitting next to the pen just out of reach so they can't bite you or mouth at your clothing through the pen. And then when you see your puppy settle, you can reinforce your puppy by either slowly dropping a treat between their paws or dropping it from above. But it's a lot calmer if you go very slowly like that. Step four, add movement away from the enclosure. By reinforcing the dog for relaxing behind the barrier when you move around the room, it will help teach him the concept of relaxing when something stimulating is going on that he can't reach. This is a great exercise for all dogs, especially those that can get easily aroused or frustrated when they cannot reach what they want to interact with. This step will also help teach a dog to relax when you walk out a door and he cannot come with you. At first, move slowly and calmly while near the pen or crate and mark and reinforce your dog for relaxing on his bed. You can use a clicker for this exercise if your dog remains calm when hearing the clicker, but if it excites your dog, I suggest using a calm marker word like good before then moving slowly to drop a treat between your dog's paws. You can practice moving around the room sitting on different pieces of furniture, talking to family members, interacting with different objects in the room, and then returning to reinforce your dog. Every once in a while, you can go and stand next to the crate and release your dog calmly from the crate. I don't suggest releasing your dog from the crate when you're at a distance and that you always release your dog from the crate when you're standing right next to it in a very neutral, boring manner. What to do if your dog gets up or starts to do a behavior that you don't want him to. I suggest that if you're doing a training session and your dog gets up and puts his paws up on the barrier or starts whining and barking, I don't suggest that you should assume that if you ignore the dog that they'll stop doing it and think to relax and be calm in their pen. Instead, I would quickly interrupt that behavior and then lower criteria so that it's easier for the dog and that the dog doesn't start to think to start offering those behaviors when he doesn't know what to do. Another problem with ignoring unwanted behavior and then reinforcing the behavior you do want is that you can sometimes create a behavior chain where the dog first offers the behavior you don't like before they offer the behavior that you do want. If your dog gets up to follow you and he doesn't yet know to offer the behavior of going back in the crate, you can lure your dog into the down position and then drastically reduce criteria. So if you took 20 steps away from your dog and that made him get up, just take a couple of steps away from your dog and reinforce your dog to get him back to the point where he's feeling comfortable and relaxed being in the crate while you move away. Another technique you can use if the dog gets out of the crate to follow you is to stand or sit next to the crate and see if the dog offers going back inside the crate to begin the training game again. Once your dog is successful with the door open, you can practice with the door closed. If at any point the dog gets up or looks worried and wants to come out of the crate or pen, you can either open the door calmly or open the door and go and sit in the pen with the dog so that he can calm down and realize that he's not trapped inside the pen. To make it easier for the dog, when you're first working on the noises of the door opening and closing, you can be in the pen with your dog or have your dog on the outside of the pen so the dog doesn't suddenly feel trapped when he's seeing the door open and close for the first few times. So every time the door makes a noise, you can say, good, and then go to feed your dog a treat. Good. Step five, alone time. When you start leaving your dog unattended, it's important to use a safe setup for your dog. The setup I have here could be extremely unsafe for some dogs that might think that they could climb over the top 
or push the pen around the room and perhaps chew on power cords or pull your curtains down. So you want to make sure it's a safe pen and for some dogs it might need to be much taller or that it has a, a lid and a base so that the dog can't get out and that perhaps you have an extra security where you, you lock it with a, a carabiner or a clip. Um, also you might want to choose a floor like getting some linoleum from a hardware store to put down underneath the pen in case the dog goes to the bathroom and your floor could easily be ruined by that. If you just got a new puppy or dog who is already comfortable with being left alone, you can immediately start leaving your dog for short periods even when you are still working on the different steps in this tutorial. Anytime you see your dog settle down for a nap, you can encourage your dog to go in his pen. Then you can sit with him until he falls asleep. Then when you hear your dog wake up and start to move around, you can calmly let the dog out of the pen. If you have a dog with separation anxiety or you're not sure whether he'll panic when he wakes up, you can leave the door to the pen open. To transition to leaving your dog in the whole house, first leave the dog in a pen and when he has stopped chewing on inappropriate things and doing undesirable behaviors when you're home watching him, you can then transition to a room and then to the whole house. When you change the picture, Go back to leaving the dog for short periods at first and be home to monitor his behavior. Some dogs will do better with being left in one room rather than in the whole house if, for example, there is a place in the house where the dog might sit and bark at noises or sights outside. I like to create a leaving ritual with my own dogs. I send them all to their beds, I give everyone a treat, and then I wave and say, see you later guys, and then I walk through the door and close it. Now, the great thing about doing this during the training sessions and when I have to leave my dogs, when I have to leave the house, is that it teaches the dogs that when I do this behavior, it means to relax and take a nap. So, if I need to use it in other situations, like I need to leave them in the car briefly, or I'm staying at someone else's house and I need to leave them there briefly, that uh, it's the same behavior that is at home. Let's go to bed. When leaving your dog for the first few times, I suggest using a video camera or putting music on and being home so that if the dog starts to worry, you can return and then go back a step in the training plan. When raising criteria, you want to make sure that you're not predictably making things harder and harder for the dog. So if you've left your dog for longer than you've ever left him before, then the next time that you leave your dog, I suggest leaving your dog for an extremely short period of time. If you have a dog that gets overexcited by greeting you when you return, you can change the picture by making your homecoming about going out to the bathroom or receiving a treat instead of a greeting. Then 10 minutes later, after your dog has had a chance to calm down, you can then greet your dog as you would have when you got home. Do you guys need to go to the toilet? Halo, this way. To set your dog up for success, provide enough physical and mental stimulation before leaving, such as walking and playing a training game. A small pen or crate is not a long-term solution for leaving a dog for extended periods of time. The end goal is having the dog loose in a room or loose in the house where he can move around and make choices throughout the day. You might need to hire a dog sitter to come and interact with your dog if you need to work long hours. Dogs are social animals and spending too much time alone or in a small confined area can cause behavior problems. The topic of this video is how long should you spend training your dog in training sessions and the answer is it really depends on a few factors which I'm going to be talking about. But it's extremely important to remember that every single interaction that you have with your dog is training them something. So you're technically training your dog 100% of the time that you interact with your dog and I don't mean to overwhelm you with that idea but you need to be mindful of your interactions with your dogs between training sessions because they're constantly learning every interaction that you have. Here's a list of factors to consider when deciding how long a training session should be for a specific behavior. You want to consider the dog's age, the dog's size, the personality of the dog, how mentally or physically taxing the behavior might be for the dog, how physically fit the dog is, how the dog is feeling on that specific day, 
and the rate of reinforcement that you're going to be using. The first factor that I mentioned is age. If you've just brought home a young puppy, I suggest keeping training sessions short, and for me, short is under 60 seconds. So if you wanna work on more stuff in a day, you can do multiple training sessions throughout the day. If you have a puppy that gets very excited by food, I suggest training after a meal. I like to feed all my dogs a big breakfast so that they're not overexcited by the food during the training. But if you have a puppy that seems uninterested in your treats or, your, or the kibble that you're using to train, you can use the breakfast to train the dog or train before a meal. After a few successful short training sessions with your puppy, you can then experiment with the length of the session. And if your puppy looks disinterested, it's no big deal. Just make sure to keep the session shorter the next few times. Keep in mind that older dogs might not want to train as long as they used to when they were younger, so you might keep sessions a little bit shorter for older dogs to keep them in the game. If you're using food to train your dog in training sessions, size plays a role in how long the session can go on for. So for um, bigger dogs, they can eat more food because they have a bigger stomach, but little dogs can't. So you can cut the treats extremely small, for these two little guys, they can even be the size of the head of a pin. Um, if it's cheese, something like cheese like this. I also use the toy dog kibble for them, which is very small. And then another thing is if I have larger treats like the toy dog kibble, I measure it out before the training session. And then when the bag ends, the training ends because there's just not enough room in their stomach to continue training. The personality of the dog can also help determine how long training sessions should be. My little chihuahua Kiko here has always preferred short sessions and if I go too long then she starts to slow down and get disinterested by the training. My terrier here is the complete opposite. When I kept sessions extremely short, under 60 seconds, he started to get way too excited by training. So instead of doing short sessions throughout the day, I would do longer sessions like three minutes and five minutes. And I found out that by doing that with him, it made him way less excited about training, which was good because he was too excited. He started making noise like growling and whining while he was training. And by having the longer sessions, it helped with that issue that I was having with him. I have three really easy border collies, so I can't screw up very much because they could train forever and not get over aroused or frustrated during the training. The next factor is how mentally or physically taxing the behavior is for the dog. So mentally taxing might be that the dog is learning a new behavior and they've never done anything quite like that behavior. So um, if you're teaching something new, Usually dogs tire faster than if they're learning something that they've already learned and you might be proofing it or just reminding them about it. And physically taxing, there are some behaviors like laying that are very easy for dogs to do and there are other behaviors like um, sit pretty, for example, when a dog's learning sit pretty at first, they don't have the muscles to sit pretty for a long duration and so by repeating the behavior, you're, the dog is actually getting tired. So one solution that you can do is train multiple behaviors in a training session and if one is physically taxing, then the next behavior you could work on is laying down. So you could do sit pretty and then laying down and then maybe circle circling around you so that the dog isn't getting tired from the training, which will then turn into disinterest in training. When training behaviors involving movement, you also want to keep in mind how physically fit your dog is. Because for example, if you asked me to do 20 push-ups, I would say no thank you. Um, but another person would say, oh wow, that's really easy, I can do that. And the same goes for dogs. So um, the fitter your dog is, the longer they usually can work. So if your dog is out of shape or overweight, they're gonna probably not be able to work as long as your friend's dog who is physically fit. The next factor is rate of reinforcement. That means how many treats you give out during the training session. So if you're using a high rate of reinforcement, like I did, for example, in the video where I was teaching my dog to bow, I was giving treat, treat, treat after treat, I'm gonna keep the training session extremely short, one, so the dog doesn't get full, and two, so the dog doesn't get overwhelmed. If you're using a, a, a low rate of reinforcement, maybe you're working on a stay with duration, then the training session could be much longer. So for example, if you're working on a stay and your dog is staying for one minute and then 20 seconds, um, the training session is gonna be much longer than um, teaching a, a sit pretty behavior.
The final factor that I'm going to talk about is how the dog is feeling on a specific day. Now, there are some dogs that even when they don't feel very well, they'll still be super excited to do training, but there are other dogs that they're just not having a very good day and it starts to show in the training session. And so if you notice your dog is seeming disinterested or overly frustrated for some reason, I suggest ending the session and then trying again later or instead trying another day. And instead of training, you can uh, substitute that for giving them a food puzzle or a yummy chew stick to entertain themselves with and create some variety in their day and then save the training for later when they're feeling better. The method that I like to use for determining how long training sessions can be is doing a few short training sessions and then doing a trial session where you go on a little bit longer and see how the dog does. If the dog does great, then I suggest doing a few short training sessions again, not back to back, and then another trial session where the training goes on for even longer than the previous trial and see how the dog does. Now I find that when you vary what you do in training sessions, for example, training a few different behaviors in the same session, that can actually help dogs um, work for longer in training sessions, where if you work on the same behavior for two minutes, dogs can get bored, depending on the behavior. For most dogs, I suggest the majority of training sessions be between 30 seconds and five minutes, but then you might wanna do a much longer training session because you've gone to a field where you wanna work with your dog and then you work with your dog for 20 minutes. Um, and the dog could be fine with that. Some dogs can work forever, like my Border Collies here, and that brings up a really important fact that they can work more than they should. So I like to set a timer when I do active behaviors so that I don't overwork them. One thing I also do is play a song on my phone. So when the song ends, I know about how long I've been training because sometimes I can get a little bit carried away. So it's important to keep in mind that when you're working with dogs that can just keep going. In this video, we're gonna go over puppy safety. Now, puppies aren't made of glass, but we need to take care when training them, letting them interact with the environment, and also when letting them interact with other dogs. Now, in my opinion, the three most important things to consider are the repetition of movement, jumping, and jolting, and rough play. In this video, we're gonna go over all of those. And I think it's really important for all puppy owners to know about this. So that's why I've made this video. So why is it important to limit rough play as well as jumping and jolting movements in puppies? Well, their bones, ligaments, muscles, and joints are all in the process of growing and are more susceptible to injury than in the bodies of adult dogs. Now there's something in puppies' long bones that are called growth plates. Now these consist of several specific cells that allow the bones to grow and they only close between 12 to 20 months of age depending on your dog's breed and size. Now it's generally accepted that while these growth, growth plates are still in your puppy's body or your adolescent dog's body, you shouldn't have your dog jump repetitively higher than their ankles, which seems completely crazy. But this doesn't mean that you should never let your puppy ever jump until they become 12 to 20 months and then suddenly start drilling them on jumps and agility. It means take care not to repeat jumping higher than the ankles until they, the growth plates have closed. And then after that, you're going to carefully work your bo dog's body up and muscles up to be able to jump as high as you wanted your dog to jump rather than suddenly crazily letting them jump just because the growth plates are, have closed. So here are some other things to consider in regards to preventing injury. The correct diet, how much you feed your puppy. If you're feeding too much or too little, you can leave your puppy susceptible to injury and incorrect growth process. Sleep and exercise are also really important. The puppy's got to be getting enough sleep and exercise, the puppy shouldn't be getting too much or too little exercise as that can be detrimental to their health and also can cause injury. Jumping and jolting movements. Are ready? Puppy, jump up. Say you've been watching TV with your puppy, woo, and he doesn't want to stay with you anymore. He wants to jump down and play with his toys. Instead of just letting him jump off the couch, you can help him down to prevent him jumping higher than his back. Now that can be very jolting. This is really, really, really important for toy dogs. 
I see a lot of people with toy dogs that aren't taking care with the dog jumping on and off of their really high bed or letting the dog run down the stairs. If you're not like me and you don't like to micromanage your dog, then simply teach your dog to sleep in a dog bed on the ground to keep them safe from jumping up and off of the couch all the time because that is something that puppies love to do. You can carry your puppy down the stairs to prevent injury. If this is not possible, you can have your puppy on a leash or train your puppy to walk calmly. Take care on slippery surfaces as slipping can cause injury to a growing puppy. Train and play on non-slip surfaces like grass, padded floor, or carpet. So I've just got Lumos some food over here and I'm reinforcing him on the ground for not jumping up in the kitchen because the floor here is very slippery and if I were just to walk on in with his food bowl, he might think to jump up. So, as I walk, I'm going to drop food down on the floor. You can also use a marker word, yes? If you're worried your puppy might jump chaotically, then you can practice these games with your puppy's food and toys on a non-slip surface first. So another really important concept for me in preventing injury in puppies, but also in adult dogs, is having your puppy or your adult dog wear a harness when attached to a leash. Now this is because if the puppy runs and hits the end of the leash, suddenly there's a huge jolting action right on their neck, which is very delicate. So when fitting a harness, I like to make sure that the harness doesn't rest on the neck if the dog were to pull, and also doesn't impede the leg movement. When the when the dog is walking. Now, all dogs are different shapes, so one ha harness might fit your dog, but it might not be a good harness for another dog. So you basically need to put the harness on and see if it touches the dog's neck. If the dog is making a gagging sound in the harness, then it's basically working in the same way a collar is, putting pressure on their neck. The longer the leash is, the more force to the jolt if your dog or your puppy were to hit the end of the leash. There can be extreme force, so take care, even in harnesses. If you have a long leash and you grab it and your dog runs to the end of the leash, that can ca cause a huge injury. Wearing a harness doesn't mean pulling on leash. Train your puppy to walk on a loose leash from day one. Rough play. A lot of people have the misconception that dogs and puppies know what's best for them in regards to play and interacting with each other. There's the potential for injury during rough play as well as if your dog is playing with larger or stronger dogs. Puppies and adult dogs can play in a safe manner as long as you're there to monitor it and interrupt it before rough play starts. Repetition. Puppies naturally offer a wide variety of movement when playing with another dog or playing on their own. In training sessions, we want to set it up so that we're not drilling the puppy and making the puppy repeat the same behavior over and over again because that can be bad for their health and cause injury. It's really important not to drill your puppy on behaviors that involve a physical movement. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to avoid drilling your puppy on the same behaviors. One way of doing it is counting out how many treats you're going to use during the training session. Another way of doing it is timing how long you train for. And a third way is you can film your training sessions and watch them back. And sometimes I myself am horrified at how long I keep going with my own dogs. So by doing these types of methods, it stops me from overtraining. Another idea is keeping a training log. So you keep track of which behaviors you work on each day. And what I do is I plan to not train the same behaviors for at least three days if there's something that involves a really physical movement. So for example, if I'm teaching leg weaving and I've worked on it quite a lot, I might spend two days not doing leg weaving. Stand to down, stand to down is quite a physical behavior, so you're not going to make your puppy repeat that every single day because that could be bad for their joints. So that's the example I'm going to use um, right now. For this training session, we're just going to work for stand to down for 10 treats and then we're going to move on and do some other exercises. The more behaviors your puppy knows, the healthier, I believe, they will be because they're using all their muscles rather than simply repeating the same behaviors over and over again. So that's why I really like to do canine freestyle with puppies. So I'll do my training demo. Where did I put my clicker? <laughs> over there. Okay, 
So, the last three. Ready? Down. Good boy. Stand. Awesome. Down. Well done. Stand. Good job. Down. Good job. Stand. Down. Awesome. Stand. Stand. Good job. And now we're going to move on to something else. If you're going to teach spin to the left, you also want to teach spin to the right. Leg weaves is also another great behavior to practice with your puppy, but obviously all these behaviors, you don't want to do them repetitively. So a great way to prevent this from happening is to teach multiple behaviors and practice them on different days of the week. Tugging with your puppy is a fun activity and can also be used as a reward during training. However, you want to keep in mind it is a behavior, and so the concepts of jolting and repetition apply to tugging. You don't want to hurt your dog by playing too much tug with your dog or playing too roughly with your dog. So there's this misconception that you should train one behavior first with your puppy, and then when that behavior is really good, you move on to the next behavior. Well, not only is there a problem with the fact that your puppy will be repeating the same movement over and over again, but it's also not good mentally. Dogs thrive on variety, and so you can make training sessions fun by adding variety of behaviors to the training session. So, in my opinion, I would, in a training session, you can work on spin to the left and spin to the right, right in the same training session. Or, if you want to work on the dog circling around you, you can practice going one way, and then going the other way right in the same training session. So this idea of repetition doesn't really apply to behavior modification. All these dogs over here are lying really calmly waiting for me to finish training Lumos and you can feed as many treats for calm behaviors as you want. If you want to practice eye contact, Lumos, good job. You can click and reinforce that or say yes and reinforce eye contact um, a calm, settle, a leave it behavior as much as you want. You can repeat it as much as you want. Leave it. Good boy. Leave it. Awesome. And the reason is because the dog's not doing any repetitive, active, jolting movements during that, those types of exercises. This video is on the topic of house training your new puppy. Now if you've just added an adult dog to your household, you can use these same techniques and I suggest by treating the adult dog like an untrained puppy at first, you will set your dog up for success by teaching him where you do want him to go first rather than leaving it to chance. Now it's important to understand that puppies and adult dogs come to us with a prior learning history. So they have a preference already as to where they like to go to the bathroom. For example, if the breeder has been having the puppies go to the bathroom on grass or the previous home that you've rescued your dog from, the dog used to go on cement and nothing else, the dogs and the puppies are most likely going to want to go on those specific substrates or surfaces. So to set yourself up for success, if you get your puppy or adult dog and they're just not going to the bathroom where you want them to go, you can experiment by using different surfaces like pebbles, grass, and sometimes horrifyingly enough, concrete. Some dogs will only go on concrete if that is where they have been living before. So what we can do is first use the substrate the dog prefers or the puppy prefers, and then you can start switching it once you're having success with the dog going to the bathroom in the location that you want, which hopefully is outside or in a litter box in your house. And then once the dog is learning to go in the correct places, then you can start switching the substrates. It also helps if you add a cue to go to the bathroom because then you can give your dog the idea to go to the bathroom on new surfaces. House training essentially consists of these two things. One, training your dog where you do want him to go, and two, using management to prevent him learning to go where you don't want him to. To train your puppy where you do want him to go, bring your puppy to the preferred location in a calm and neutral manner. 
If the location is extremely big, like outside, you might consider having your puppy on a leash and harness or having an area in the yard that has a pen in it so you can take your puppy to the pen and then let your puppy wander around in the pen until he's gone to the bathroom. Once he starts to go to the bathroom, I suggest waiting till he's just finished to praise or mark and reinforce with a treat. Now, if you have a puppy or an adult dog that gets very distracted by you carrying or holding food, that can get in the way of learning where to go. So I suggest keeping the treats inside and using just praise when outside. So after the puppy's gone, you can make exciting noises like, yay, good boy, oh my goodness, like that. And then you could play with your puppy as well while outside. Once you start to recognize the signals that your puppy is about to go to the bathroom, you can add a verbal cue to the behavior. I actually like to add a verbal cue to both peeing and pooping. And this is very helpful if you're traveling somewhere or you, there's an emergency and you have to leave the house and your dog's just not thinking to go to the bathroom, you can tell them to go to the bathroom. And it's really easy and puppies can pick it up very quickly. So you just say the cue, just before they go to the bathroom, and then after they go to the bathroom, praise them or feed a treat. Do you want to go out? Okay. Go pee. Good girl. Good girl. One technique that I learned when working at a shelter to help dogs get the idea to go to the bathroom is to calmly walk in circles and figures of eight in the area that you want the dog to go as if to simulate what another dog might be doing when they're searching for the right spot to go to the bathroom rather than just standing and staring at the dog who might then stand and stare back at you or doing exciting movements in front of the dog while they're trying to concentrate on going to the bathroom. Now, once the dog starts to go to the bathroom, it's important not to mark or get excited in the middle of the process because sometimes that can make the puppy stop peeing. So I suggest waiting right till the end when they're just finished to then praise your puppy or mark and reinforce with a treat. When you first bring home your new puppy or adult dog, I suggest bringing them to the preferred location at least once an hour to give them the opportunity to go to the bathroom. They might not need to go every single time you take them, but the more frequently you take them out, the higher the success rate of the dog learning to go in the correct location, because if you wait too long, the dog might go to the toilet inside your house. Now, in between taking your dog out, you can keep your dog in a pen, or I suggest having your dog loose and watching your dog 100% of the time while he's loose. Also to limit the amount of your house that he has access to while you're watching him. So at first you could begin house training in your living room or the room that you like to be in the most and you're watching the dog the whole time and the doors to the other rooms are closed or there's a barrier there. That way you don't have to get up every time your dog goes searching into another room and then you can work on room by room. So first maybe you'd work on the living room, then maybe you'd work in the bedroom, and if you have rooms upstairs, you can practice having your dog upstairs in a room, and then at a certain point you can say something like, do you need to go to the bathroom or do you wanna go outside? And then you can show your dog how to get outside to go to the bathroom, or your puppy, um, because what can happen is sometimes Dogs don't understand that they can go to the door to, that leads to outside when they're upstairs and might just go to the bathroom in one of the rooms furthest from the area that they hang out in. Similar to humans, puppies and dogs tend to want to go to the bathroom in between activities. So for example, if your puppy has just been sleeping and is now awake, he'll probably want to go to the bathroom. So taking your puppy out to the bathroom at these times will set you up for success with training your puppy where he should go when he wants to go. Other examples of change of activities are when your puppy's done with his dinner or a meal, when he's finished drinking water, when you've finished doing a training session with your pup, or when he's done playing with another dog. Using management and prevention for house training. It's important to understand that when an animal rehearses a behavior, no matter what consequence follows, that animal will be more likely to do that behavior than if the animal had never done the behavior to begin with. So what does that mean? It means that if we set up the environment so that the dog isn't thinking to go to the bathroom in the house, 
and preferring to go to the bathroom outside, that is going to be more successful than trying to just let the dog um, do what he wants and then when he goes to the bathroom, punish him. Another side effect of using punishment is that you're not teaching the dog where you do want them to go and what can quickly happen is that the dog can make the connection that the punishment only happens when you're in the room when the dog goes to the bathroom. So there have been many cases where um, dogs will hide in the house to go to the bathroom or only go to the bathroom in the house when the owner leaves. And that can make it even harder to train the dog to go in the appropriate area. So what should you do if your dog does go to the bathroom inside your house? I suggest if you see your dog just about to go to the bathroom, you can run to the door going, pop, 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 let's go outside, and show them that it's outside that you want them to go to the bathroom. But if you have an extremely sensitive dog or you've rescued a dog that is kind of scared of you, sometimes if you act too excitedly when they're going to the bathroom, they can find it so extremely punishing that it almost acts in the same way as if someone were to scold their dog or hit them with a newspaper. So you have to be sensitive as to whether you're scaring your dog when you're trying to entice them to go outside. Some puppies are very happy-go-lucky and you see them just about to go to the bathroom, you can pick them up and take them outside. Other puppies, uh, they see you coming and they're terrified the next time because they remember it was such a traumatizing event when you pick them up. So you have to really take care with that. Um, once they've started going to the bathroom in your house, um, there's really nothing you can do, and I don't suggest using punishment. What I do suggest is then increasing your vigilance and increasing, uh, decreasing the time between when you take the puppy out and cleaning whatever it is that the dog went to the bathroom on. So I personally like to use something called nature's miracle to clean things, and I promise you they have not paid me to talk about them. I don't do any sort of sponsoring products, but that is my favorite uh, product for, for cleaning up something that you don't want the dog to then mark on again. Um, so I will either clean something with nature's miracle, or I'll simply throw away whatever it is. So if it's a small, cheap rug, I will throw it away or use it for something outside um, rather than uh, set my puppy up for failure by having something that smells of urine in the house. Now bleach and just washing stuff in the machine can sometimes not remove the odor of the urine for the dog and that can make them want to go to the bathroom even more in those specific areas that they've been before. Um, Another idea that you can do is to, if your dog has repeatedly gone to the bathroom in a specific place, you can sprinkle food there and play find it games where the dog eats food off of the area where they go to the bathroom so they can start learning it's a place where they eat rather than go to the toilet. You can put a bed there, you can put their water bowl there, and um, naturally as, as clean, cleanly people, we don't want to go in the areas that the dogs have gone to the bathroom in the house, so you might unconsciously avoid those areas, especially if it's under a table. So I suggest if you're doing a training session with your dog and you've cleaned the area and it's now dry, you can start training your puppy or dog in those areas so the dog's associating that area um, that it's not a toilet. Very frequently, if you have rooms in your house that you very rarely use, um, those might be the rooms that if they're open and the dog needs to go and um, hasn't been able to get your attention to go out, they might go in those rooms. So you can, uh, if you're doing a training session, you can use those rooms for training and that will make your dog less likely to want to go to the toilet in those rooms. If you have an adult dog that started to poop in your house, one thing you can do is feed the dog at regular times rather than a random feeding schedule, like a leaving food down, where they're just eating randomly at different times and making them go to the bathroom randomly. Um, you can also walk your dog at predictable times. So I suggest a walk in the morning and the evening uh, to get them stimulated to want to poop. Um, and if they don't poop on the walk, you could do some type of activity that gets them a little bit excited. So maybe um, playing chase, or throwing a ball, or doing something that gets the dog a tiny bit excited to make them want to go to the bathroom. It can seem a little bit overwhelming at first, taking the dog out all the time and supervising the dog 100% of the time when he's not put away, 
but I really suggest that at least for the first two weeks when you get your new puppy or dog to be doing this because not only can you just be focusing on house training, but by supervising your dog 100% of the time that he's loose, you can also be reinforcing your dog for all the appropriate behaviors he's doing, like relaxing at your feet when you watch TV, or playing with his toys, or playing with you with his toys, and you'll be right there to interrupt behaviors you don't like, for example, bothering your cat, or going and chewing on your furniture. So if your dog is doing these inappropriate behaviors, you're already there watching and making sure that he doesn't have a reinforcement history for rehearsing these behaviors. So I like to use a kissy noise or a recall. So if the pup goes over to chew on the furniture, you can say pop, 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 and then redirect the dog to playing with his toys. And by doing this in the first two weeks, you set yourself up for faster training and also um, your dog isn't rehearsing all those undesirable behaviors which makes them harder to get rid of in the future. It's important to note that going to the toilet can also be a sign of stress or anxiety. So simply working on just house training and not working on the problem that's causing the stress and anxiety can mean that the dog will continue to go to the toilet inside the house. For example, if your dog goes to the toilet immediately when you leave the house, it could be that the dog is worried or anxious about you leaving. And when you work on the problem, that is really going to help with the house training problem that you're having. Using an indoor toilet for house training. A lot of people are on the fence about whether they should use an indoor toilet, such as a litter box, for their new puppy or adult dog when left unattended in a pen. Now there are some pros and cons to using a litter box and I'm going to go over them. Some of the cons to using an indoor toilet with your dog is that the dog can start to generalize to other things in the house. So for example, if you're using pee pads, sometimes a dog can start to think that your shirt in the corner or one of the grocery bags is a pee pad and then go to the toilet on those. But in my experience, if you're taking your dog out as frequently as you would take your dog out if they didn't have a litter box, that problem is going to be very, very unlikely to happen as if you're only having your dog go to the toilet inside the house in the litter box. Another con is how much room they take up. So the larger the dog or puppy, the larger the litter box has to be. And some dogs don't like to pee and poop in the same area. So if you have a dog like that, once they've peed in the litter box or the pee pads, they're not going to want to go near that to go to the toilet. Um, and conversely, if they pooped there, they might not want to pee there. So you need to have a larger area for them to be able to get away from whatever they've created before. Um, one way to get around this is to be very cleanly and continually clean the litter box and not leave the dog in that pen long enough where they would need to go multiple times. So walking your adult dog or puppy just before they go in there and having them go to the bathroom first is going to set them up for success. If you're using pee pads in your pen, some puppies and adult dogs like to play with them and tear them apart thinking they are an interactive toy that you've left for them to play with, like the other toys you might leave in the pen. So I suggest taping the pads down in the litter box at first, and you might need to tape them down always, but that can help the dog not think to have the idea to pick up the corner and just start tearing away at them, especially because some of them are really expensive. Some of the pros to using a litter box is that when you leave your puppy unattended, say you go to the grocery store and then suddenly you're stuck in traffic and you're not getting home as soon as you thought you would, that you have that peace of mind that if your puppy does need to go to the bathroom, he can. Another pro to using a litter box is that if there's terrible weather outside and your dog just won't go to the bathroom outside, you still have the litter box. In fact, when I lived in Sweden and I just moved there, there were a whole bunch of fireworks going off every day um, for celebrations and it was very traumatizing for my chihuahua to go outside. So every time she went outside, she would get very scared and then she couldn't go to the bathroom. So I got some pee pads and then she could go to the bathroom inside and I could work on her fear of fireworks um, in small achievable steps and get her over that without having to drag her outside you know, five times a day and experience these scary noises. So the litter box really saved my training for my little chihuahua Kiko. And um, also some dogs, actually my little dogs were really great. 
um, in Sweden, but some dogs just don't like going in rain or snow. So having that litter box there for your little dog to go in when they really don't feel like going to the bathroom outside can be very helpful. It really depends on your dog and your circumstance as to whether a litter box is going to be useful for your training. For example, my latest puppy, Halo, when I got him at eight weeks, he was extremely house trained. Um, the breeder had trained him to go to the bathroom reliably outside, and also she'd worked on separation training, so I could, within days, just leave him in a pen and know that he wasn't going to go to the bathroom or feel like going to the bathroom if I left him in there short enough because he knew the toilet was outside. However, with my previous puppy, Wish, she didn't seem to know um, that the bathroom was outside, so I had to use um, a technique where I put uh, pee pads everywhere in the pen except for a small corner where her bed was and then I would sprinkle kibble on there so she could start to learn to pee on the pee pads. Um, I also think she had less control over her bladder because she would walk around and suddenly, you know, she'd be playing and then peeing. So if you have a dog that's doing stuff like that where they have very little control of their bladder, um, or they need to go so frequently compared to another puppy, I find using the, the pee pads or a litter box extremely helpful in the training, in separation training especially, because then you don't have to worry while you're trying to teach your puppy to be left alone that they need to go to the bathroom. And, and that your house training is getting ruined um, while you're doing the separation training. So what, if you have a dog that is just peeing on everything or completely unhouse trained, what you can do is use that same technique of setting up a pen where everywhere is a toilet in the pen and then you gradually shrink the toilet into one corner. So you might begin with <laughs> the whole floor being just pee pads and then figuring out which corner the dog likes to sleep in and not go to the toilet in and then you shrink the pee pads into the corner that the dog uses the most and then put it in a, um, in a box. Then, if you take your dog out frequently enough um, outside, as you would with a dog that doesn't have a litter box, so you're taking the puppy or adult dog out every hour to go to the bathroom, and every time you notice there's a change in activity in the dog, then what I find, actually it's been 100%, is that the dog prefers to go outside rather than in the pen. So I've trained both my little dogs, and I got my little terrier with a house training issue, and he always will prefer to go outside rather than in any sort of litter box inside, even if it's snowing. Uh, so that's my technique for um, training dogs to, uh, to go to the bathroom outside and utilizing a, um, an indoor toilet. But it's also important to know where to set up the litter box to begin with. Most people will naturally want to put the litter box as far away from the door of the pen as possible where you enter um, and then have the bed and the food near the door where you come in and then the toilet at the back. That makes sense to us. But to puppies, if they're left in a room, say this room, and there's a door over here and their pen is here, most puppies, they will come to the, the gate to look for you because they want to go to the bathroom. And then some puppies won't think that, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. I'll go back to the back wall and go there. They will stand at the gate and then they'll go to the toilet there waiting for you because they prefer to go outside. So with dogs that prefer to go outside and have a litter box, I suggest putting the, the litter box at the front of the pen towards the door that you come in and out of the room. And then at the back, having the bed and the water and the toy area for the puppy to go in his crate and sleep in his bed and play with his toys. And then if he needs to go to the bathroom, then he comes to the gate area and that's where the toilet is. I find that is the most successful way to set up an area, um, but it really depends on the dog. Some are extremely house trained and they'll really want to go to their litter box, especially if the breeder has trained that behavior. Um, so it's important that if you have gone to a breeder or maybe the humane society or rescue that you got the puppy from, their fosters used a specific way to teach the dogs to go to the bathroom. You can use that same way in the pen that you set up. This video is on the topic of the advantages and the disadvantages to using crates and tethers with young puppies. Now, in my opinion, it's extremely important to teach every puppy how to behave when in a small confined area like a crate as well as on a short leash. 
This is because even though you might not intend for your puppy to ever be in that situation in their whole life because you live in the country, at some point there might be an emergency or you might need to go to the vet and your dog will have to be on a leash as well as have to be in a crate if they're going to get an operation for something. Say your dog's broken their leg and they need to be kept in a crate in the back room of the vet before the operation or after they wake up. So for me, it's extremely important to teach dogs how to behave on a leash and in a crate. When on a short leash or in a crate, a dog's movement is very limited. They can literally stand up, turn around, and lay down again. So I believe it's extremely important for us to teach dogs that when they're in a situation where they can't make any choices, that they should enjoy relaxing, it's time for a nap, or just to settle and look around in the environment and know that they will be released at some point. Without training your dog what to do when confined on a short leash or in a crate, some dogs are going to be okay with it and figure it out that it's a time to relax, but other dogs with different personalities might feel frustrated, stressed, or even anxious in these situations without any training. I like to think of it in the way that what a person would feel like is most likely similar to being trapped in an elevator. You have all these intentions about what you're going to be doing during the day and then suddenly the elevator closes and doesn't open again and that can feel for some people very stressful, frustrated and when you had intentions of doing other things and not being standing in an elevator, the time in the elevator can be extremely stressful and for some people even frightening because you don't know if you're going to get out again. And I believe that's how some dogs feel when they're put into crates and they've had no training. So um, I like to train the crate as a bedroom. So when the dog goes into the crate, they know it's time for sleeping. And when the door opens, then the sleeping time is over like a bedroom rather than an elevator. When you've taught your puppy or dog to settle when on a short leash or in a crate, it can then become an amazing tool to help you with managing your dog's behavior. Say, for example, if you'd like to go to a cafe with your dog, you can sit down and because the dog is confined to a short leash, they know it's time to relax and take a break. Or if you need to go on a plane somewhere and your dog goes into their crate, it's a great way for the puppy or the dog to relax on the plane being in their little crate. I personally love bringing a crate or a short leash and a mat to parks and places um, where if I'm going to be there all day the dog needs a break and the perfect place for a dog to relax and get some sleep is inside of a crate or on his mat. Personally I prefer the crate because the dog knows that nothing's going to bother him while he's asleep. So I always bring crates for my dogs if we're going to be doing some all-day event so they can relax and have a break when they need to. Crates and leashes are also great for managing behavior. For example, introducing dogs together where you're practicing working on dogs settling near each other and the leash is there for safety in case one dog were to get up and overwhelm the other dog. Another great use for a crate is that once your puppy understands that a crate is about taking a nap or settling, then you can take the crate and put it in your car and then it makes it so much easier to train your puppy to relax and take a nap while you're driving somewhere. Now, if you don't train your puppy to be calm and relaxed in the car, what can happen if you go exciting places is that your dog can learn to walk around inside your of your car looking out the windows and getting excited and then when you get to the place that you want to go the dog can be way too excited and it can kind of interfere with your training of teaching your dog to walk in, on a loose leash when out and about. There are some disadvantages to using crates and tethers with puppies and for me the biggest one is that it really limits their movement and choices. So young puppies are kind of like human toddlers. They need to move around constantly for a large period during the day because their body won't grow normally if they're not moving around. If their movement is limited to standing up, turning around and laying down, their body is going to grow differently than if they were loose, moving around and interacting with the environment because as they're doing that, they're building their, the correct muscles and their legs are going to grow normally with the movement where if their movement is too limited and they're spending way too much time um, on a leash or in a crate, 
um, they're not going to grow in the same way as a dog that is loose. Their brains also, in my opinion, aren't going to grow the same way if the dog isn't interacting with the environment, like the toys in the environment and um, the nature outside, if they're just on a leash or in a crate prevented from doing any sort of activity or making any choices of their own. So in my opinion, in conjunction with training your dog to relax and take a nap when on a short leash or in a crate, it's extremely important for us to teach our puppies what to do when loose in the area that you're going to be leaving your dog as an adult. So um, you might have your dog inside your house or confined to a bedroom or something like that when you're gone. And that way, during the day while you're at work, your dog can make choices that involve moving around and using their body rather than just standing up, turning around and laying down again. Now, if you keep your puppy or your dog on a leash and in the crate, all the time, that's not going to teach your puppy what to do when loose in your living room or loose when home alone. So it's extremely important to work on those behaviors. I personally, when I get a new puppy, I'm not tethering the puppy to me because in that first two weeks, the puppy's literally a blank slate in your house. They have no reinforcement history of anything that they want to do. And so I'll have my puppy loose and I'll be showing my puppy all the behaviors and all the things I want him to be doing when loose and interrupting him and getting his attention when he starts to have ideas about what he would want to do. And by doing this for two weeks, I usually, with every puppy, have a puppy that can be loose in the house extremely fast. The only thing you want to keep in mind is that when you have a young puppy that's around eight weeks, they're going to be chewing on stuff because of their teeth growing in. And then once the chewing ends, you think you're um, scot-free and that the puppy's never going to chew on anything again. But as they hit around five months or tw around 20 weeks, sometimes even 18 weeks, um, they can start to want to chew on stuff again and then you'll need to use management. So I suggest that you shouldn't leave a puppy loose until they're about six months old. Um, but instead of confining a puppy to a, a, a crate or on a short leash, I suggest that the puppy has a large pen when the owner can't watch the puppy um, and, and direct the puppy to be making the correct choices about what to do when loose in their house. On the internet, there's a lot of information about using a crate or a tether to teach your puppy not to go to the toilet inside your house. But in my opinion, it's more important to focus on the idea of teaching your puppy where you do want them to go, which is outside. So instead of confining the puppy to a crate and a leash all the time while inside, so they're not wanting to go to the toilet in the same area that they're laying, I suggest having the puppy loose and then frequently taking the puppy out when he wakes up from a nap when he's just eaten, when he's just had some water, when he's just played, when you've just done some training together, those are the perfect times to take a puppy out to see if, he go, if he'll go to the bathroom. And also taking the puppy out extremely frequently and reinforcing your puppy when he does go outside. And I do have information on house training and I'll link that in the description below. But for me, it's extremely important to teach our puppy the skills of being loose in your house and not always confined to a leash or a crate because what can also happen is um, if a puppy, and I've seen this a lot because I get a lot of emails from people that they've been crate, uh, house training their puppy by keeping them in a crate or on a leash all the time. And then when the puppy's not in the crate or the leash, the puppy doesn't know how to behave and starts to behave abnormally. So uh, some of the things that I've seen, and this is not based on any science, it's just opinion and experience, but um, what I've experienced a lot is puppies where they're kept too long in a crate and too long in a leash, when let loose, they tend to have pika, which is they start to devour things that they see. So when let loose, they just start eating things like coins or pebbles or trying to eat bark obsessively. Um, and when I've suggested to not have the puppy ever in a, in a crate for a few weeks and instead in a pen, the puppies have stopped obsessively eating things. Another thing is biting really hard and being overexcited. So a lot of puppies, they immediately sleep on a leash or in a crate, but when loose in the house, they don't know how to settle and they run around excitedly 
um, just doing stuff obsessively. So um, if you notice that that is happening, it could be that the puppy is spending too much time in a small confined area or confined on a leash and the side effects are showing when the puppy is loose. So for me, to prevent these side effects, when I do leave my puppy, um, I like to leave my puppy in a large pen, uh, a puppy-proof pen so they can't make any mistakes that has a crate with a bed in it, some toys, and some water. Um, if the puppy is extremely unhouse trained, I might have puppy pads in there. But if I'm home and I'm working on house training, I'll put the puppy into that pen when I can't watch the puppy, and then the puppy can move around and make choices naturally and have their body grow naturally where they feel like moving and they can, um, then I will frequently take the puppy out to go to the bathroom and then put the puppy back in the pen and get back to work. Maybe I'm editing a video or something like that. Um, and then the puppy can make choices while I'm working. In regards to tethering your puppy or your new adult dog to you the whole time that you're home with your dog, I've actually found some disadvantages to that. And one is if you don't train your puppy not to pull on leash, or what to do when on a leash before doing this, what you can do is teach your puppy to pull on leash. Because if you just tie them to you at certain points, what's going to happen is the puppy's going to want to do other things and every time they pull, they're going to be rehearsing pulling on leash. The other possible disadvantage that I've noticed when clients have told me that they've used this method in the past is that the dog has a tendency to have less interest in the person that they're attached to than the other members of the family. So a lot of times people will want their dog to bond with their, say, their child who the dog's going to be the service dog for, but when the dog is has to be with the person and can't get away, so they're constantly with the person and there are other people that the dog would like to interact with, sometimes it can work against the idea of bonding and the dog just literally wants to get away from the person and get to do the things that he wants to do. So for that circumstance, I believe the best way to build that bond in that relationship is through choice and reinforcement. When animals find it reinforcing to be with you, that's going to build your relationship with your animal where they have to be with you all the time and they have no choice to get away. Um, that's not going to, that's going to habituate them to being around you, but to really build your relationship, it's extremely important to use reinforcement. So in that example of a family wanting the dog to like the the child that they're going to be the service dog for, the best way to do that would be for the kid to use the highest value treats and perhaps the family when they train the dog they use lower value treats than that child and that when that child works with the dog they're using a really high rate of reinforcement and maybe with the parents they're using less high re rate of reinforcement so the dog is realizing wow this kid is amazing. So the question that you might be wanting to ask is, how long is too long for my puppy or adult dog to be kept in a crate daily? And in my opinion, the answer is, it really depends on your dog's genetics, their personality, their previous training, and their previous history of behavior inside of a crate. So for example, if you have a mellow dog that likes to sleep all the time and likes small spaces, then that dog is gonna do way better being kept in a crate than another dog that is more active or a dog that is very impulsive and feels frustrated when uh, he wants to do something and he's blocked from doing that certain thing. So um, I find those dogs don't do as well in a crate because their choices are confined to very little choices of basically just standing up, turning around, and laying down again. And I find for some dogs that um, is very frustrating for them and it's hard to, um, for them to actually enjoy being in a crate. So um, yes, we can teach some dogs to spend a few hours in a crate, but there are other dogs that could spend eight hours and be perfectly happy coming out. Uh, for example, when I flew from Sweden to San Diego and my little dogs were in their crates, they were in their crates for nine and a half hours. And when I opened the door for them to come out, they didn't come out of their crates because they were relaxed and happy. Sure, they had full, full bladders, but they were so comfortable they didn't want to come out. Where other dogs, the nine hours, even with tons of training, would have been extremely stressful for, for some dogs. 
So for me, as I previously said, I like to train the dogs to be loose or confined to a single room in the house when being left, and that way the dog can make choices as to what to do when home alone rather than be in a crate. But you might have to use a crate for some reason. For example, you're at a hotel and um, they have to be in crates at hotels, or um, your dog's never been in a hotel before and you know your dog's gonna be better in a crate than loose in the room. But if you're keeping your dog in a crate because you know um, they're going to destroy your house or go to the toilet all over your house, you really need to think of a way to be able to set up training sessions so that you are working on the issue with the goal of the dog um, being loose and not making mistakes. So one way of doing this is getting a dog sitter to come and walk your dog and let your dog out of the crate so they're not spending the whole time you're at work confined to a crate where they can just stand up, turn around, and lay down, but they're actually um, having some activities, so the crate is becoming a bedroom where they're, um, they're sleeping, and then they're also able to move around and make choices during the day because the dog sitter comes to help um, and let them out and do stuff with them. But um, one way to progress from a crate to being loose in the house is if you think your dog uh, is destroying stuff because of other reasons like separation anxiety, you have to work on those problems uh, in conjunction with teaching them the appropriate behaviors. So um, you might start out with the dog being left in the crate, then a secure pen, and some ways to secure a pen is getting those X pens with a top and a bottom and securing it um, with, with zip ties or um, carabiners so the dog can't get the top and the bottom off and then expanding as your dog succeeds to having a whole room to themselves where you're home while the dog is being left in the room and you have a camera. So that way your dog is learning to be alone in a room and then when your dog can be alone in the room while you're home, you can practice having music on where your dog doesn't know if you're home or not and because you're in the house, you'll be able to hear your dog moving around or you can have your dog being filmed and then you can know if your dog is doing something um, that you dislike inside the room. So just to reiterate, a leash and a crate are amazing dog training tools when you teach your dog what to do when on a leash or in a crate and you're also teaching your dog what to do when they're off leash and loose in your house. It's really important that dogs take treats nicely during training, otherwise they can bite your hand or they can get over aroused by the treat delivery and then that can kind of interfere with the training that you're doing. So I'm going to show you how to teach your dog to take treats nicely and then you're going to do these um, sessions on taking treats nicely separately from your training and until your dog can take treats nicely, you can deliver the treat in a way that your dog isn't going to bite your hand. So the first step is choosing a time when your dog is a little bit sleepy and relaxed and you can see that Wish here is not in a very excitable mood. It's the perfect time to work on it because when she is excited, her mouth has started to get hard when I give her the treats. So um, I suggest when you train this exercise that you cut the treats a little bit bigger and you use treats that aren't messy. So if you're holding a treat and little crumbs are falling off, if your dog does bite, they're going to get little bits of crumbs and get reinforced for taking the treat hard. So I've got some string cheese that I've cut up in pretty big pieces. Usually I don't use such big pieces. Uh, some hot dog, some turkey hot dog, and some kibble. Now, if you have a dog that is extremely excited by food, you can do something that my friend Sean Davies does, which is use a treat that the dog doesn't really even like. So, um, by giving the dog a piece of carrot and they take it like, hmm, I don't really like this that much, then they get reinforced by the treat they really wanted. So that's a great technique for starting. Um, other great techniques are working on some impulse control and calmness first. So I'm going to link in this tutorial capture and calmness where you feed your dog for settling and not thinking about the food. So when your dog is relaxed and calm, and not thinking about the food. So right now, I don't know if, if Wish is still thinking about the food, but it looks like she's noticed something at the window. I can say, yep. 
and then mark her by feeding her between her paws. So that's the, a really great first step to teaching a dog to be calm around food, which will help to make their mouth less hard when taking the treat, because it can also have to do with the dog's arousal level. Game one. So this game is, I'm going to go and I'm going to put the treat down between her paws, and I actually haven't played this with her, so um, let me just line her up better so you can see. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put the treat down between her paws, but if she touches my hand to get it, I'm not going to let it go. I'm just going to move it back. If she waits for my hand to put it down, then I'm going to release it and move my hand back calmly. It's really important that you don't move fast during these exercises to calm your dog down around treats. You're going to move slowly, and if the dog goes for your hand, you're just going to move backwards, not in like a ha ha ha, you suck kind of way, but in a just, oh, I'm not going to give it to you if you're going to take, take it excitedly. So I have my hand down on the ground, and then I'm going to release it and let her eat it. It helps to put it under the dog's chin so that they don't have to lunge forwards to get the treat. Good job. Awesome. <clears throat> you could add eye contact where you Wait for the dog to look at you. Wish. Hi. Now with some hot dog. If your dog is successful with the low value treats, you can start using higher value treats. Good job, Wish. If you notice your dog gets very excited, you can always take a break and wait till your dog has relaxed to begin the training again. Good job. Game two. So the next game is moving your hand very slowly towards your dog and then as it gets there, releasing the treat if you only feel the dog's lips and tongue or very soft teeth. Good job. And it's important, as Kay Lawrence actually mentions, that you get the treat to your dog's face rather than hold it out so that they have to snag it. Once your dog is successful with the low value treat, then you can start using higher value treats. This is cheese here. Good job. You can also practice doing things like an exciting treat delivery. So I'm going to throw the cheese. That's going to make her more likely to want to take the treat hard out of my hand. Good job. Awesome. Also practice in different positions. So standing up and giving the dog a treat. While the dog's in front of you, at the different sides, she thinks she's supposed to do something. Good job. Go between. Oh, you want to do cup, cup? Okay, then. Good girl. Game three. So another technique for dogs that take treats extremely hard is teaching the dog to lick the treat out of your hand. So when you feel the tongue licking, you release the treat into their mouth. Just a licking tongue. Then you can put it on a cue once the behavior is reliable that the dog is licking the treat out of your hand. Then you can add the cue lick. Tug, lick. Good job. Tug, lick. Yes. So you say lick and they don't lick, then they don't get the treat. It can take some time to train this. As you saw, um, Tug isn't reliably licking the treat into his mouth. Sometimes he tries to take it. Good job. When your dog is reliably licking the treat out of your hand five times in a row, I would suggest adding the cue, lick, before you present the treat. Lick. Good. Lick. Yeah. Let's see what that looks like in slow motion. Adding the marker. 
The next step, once your dog is taking treats softly, is incorporating the clicker. If you plan to click and then feed your dog a treat with your hand, I suggest that you do this exercise. All you're doing is you're thinking about what position you want your dog to be in while you're training when you haven't given your dog any information yet. So I don't mind standing, laying down or sitting, but I definitely do mind shuffling the feet or offering strange behaviors in between. So I'm going to practice seeing if she's taking the treats softly before I click. So she is. So next up I'm going to click and then move to feed her a treat. And she did it very nicely. She's not moving around. She looks great. Another thing you could do is if you want your dog to stare at your eyes instead of the treats, you could, you could wait and see if your dog would look at your eyes before you click and treat. Awesome. I'm going to practice with her sitting and also standing. Awesome. So if she does take the treat hard, I'm just not going to let go because we're not really training anything important. We're just working on how she takes the treat. Good job. I'm also using the low value treats now that I'm using the clicker because the clicker does make her excited. Now I'm going to practice with her standing up. So she's taking the treats a little harder in the standing position than she was in the laying down position. So I'm going to wait till her mouth is soft before I start clicking. There she almost got the treat for taking it hard. There you go. Good job. using the slow treat delivery to set her up for success. So this time I'm going to see if she might look at me before I click. Good job. Good girl. You can also practice with your uh, marker words like yes. When I said yes, I saw her pupils dilate. Awesome. What to do in training sessions if your dog takes treats hard. So while you're training your dog to have a soft mouth, during training sessions where you're training other behaviors, you can either feed your dog in a number of ways. One successful way for some dogs is feeding like a horse where you put the treat on your hand and bring it under the dog's chin, and then the dog usually eats it quite nicely. There are some dogs that, that scrape your hand or just slam their face into your hand to get the treat. So then for those dogs, I wouldn't suggest using the feeding like a horse method. That, that works really well for tug. Another method is putting the treat down on the ground and releasing it. And if the dog goes for your hand, obviously you don't give the treat until, you've, uh, until the dog doesn't touch your hand. Um, there's also tossing the treat, but what can happen okay, is it can make the dog very excited. But if you're training freestyle, for example, um, and you want your dog to be very excited, no big deal. Legs! Legs! Get it! Woo! Jump through! Woohoo! Good boy. Sit. Well, pause. Awesome. This video is on the topic of introducing a new dog to your multi-dog household. Now, if you have a dog that has never been around dogs, or you're just not sure what your dog will do around other dogs, or has acted fearful, anxious, reactive, or even aggressive towards dogs, I suggest getting help from a veterinary behaviorist or a trainer that doesn't use any forms of physical or psychological intimidation to help you with this training. First Encounters Set up the first encounters so all dogs have a positive experience when in the presence of the new dog. Control the environment to reduce stress and arousal.
don't let the encounter get to the point where one dog feels he has to intimidate or correct the other. Tips for first encounters. Begin in a neutral environment. This will be less startling for a dog who has never encountered dogs in his own home and will allow you to create greater distance if needed than confined to a room. Settles together. Have both dogs settle on a mat at a distance and receive positive feedback for noticing the other dog, such as verbal praise and treats. Calm walks together. Walk parallel from each other at a distance. Mark and reinforce when your dog notices the other dog. If one dog is calm, confident, and friendly with other dogs, you can have that dog walk ahead of the other dog that is unsure. After success with parallel walking, you can practice walking past each other in an arc and then past each other in a straight line. Decrease the distance if the dogs are calm and confident and increase the distance if the dogs start to show signs of stress or unease. Having the dogs settle first at a distance and then closer together is a great way to reinforce the dogs for being calm in each other's presence. What can happen if you have a puppy whose first experiences are with playing with the other dog when meeting, it can be hard to teach the puppy that the sight of the other dog isn't an invitation to play and bother the other dog. Unless you have an extremely calm, social, and confident dog, when first meeting another dog, especially in a situation that he is not used to, it can cause him to feel stressed and excited. This excitement can sometimes cause a dog to overreact or act unpredictably. So the safest method for preventing the dogs from having a negative experience during their first encounters is to break the steps up so the dogs are feeling safe and confident every step of the way. When I first got my latest puppy, Halo, he was very confident and relaxed around my own dogs, but when seeing strange dogs in the environment, he started to become a little bit timid. So what I did was meet people with calm, friendly, social dogs, and I had them walk in front of me so that Halo could follow behind and build his confidence, and I also worked on settling with the other dogs. To build a positive association with the new puppy, every time you give the puppy a treat, you give your adult dog a treat. You want to do it in that order because that means you paying attention to your puppy predicts that you give your dog a treat. If you give your dog a treat and then give the puppy a treat, the dog's not going to get as strong an association of the puppy predicting something good happening. So anytime you pet your puppy or give your puppy attention or your puppy moves and you have a dog that's worried or dislikes the puppy, you pay attention to the puppy or the puppy does something and then Good job, Wish. And Wish gets something amazing. Hey, Wishy. Good girl. So brave. Good. Anytime you see your dog look at the puppy, when they move, you can also mark, tell them how good they are, and then give them a treat. Now, you want to make sure that the distance is far enough apart that your dog is comfortable. If your dog looks like your dog is threatening the puppy or doing warning signs or just can't look away from the puppy, and is too hyper fixated, then you need to create distance. So when they were first hanging out, Wish was on the other side of a barrier, getting used to the puppy for a couple of days before being this close and off leash. Hey Wish, good job. Good job. It really helps if you have another family member or friend to help you with this because it can be a little bit tricky to train two dogs at once. First interactions. If you're blessed with introducing dogs that are social, calm, and polite with each other, you might not need to manage the social interaction at all. Kiko, my chihuahua, is one of those dogs that I rarely have to manage at all around puppies unless the puppy is a little older and might actually hurt her by jumping on her. Splash, my 12-year-old Border Collie, who usually has no interest in playing with puppies, found Halo to be the perfect match for her, and they play very similarly, so I didn't have to do much management at all when they were playing. If one dog is calm, confident, and friendly, and the other dog is a little bit unsure and needs more time to warm up, you can have the confident dog stand, sit, or lay down calmly, and the dog that's unsure can approach and sniff the dog from behind briefly without having to go face-to-face -face with that dog. 
You can feed the dog that is getting sniffed and keep a hold of his collar. If you are worried, he will suddenly turn around and go face to face with the dog that is unsure. Keep the sniffing short so no dog gets overwhelmed. Two to three seconds is a great idea. You can then cue the dog to move away with you on leash. Only do this with dogs that are comfortable with the exercise as some dogs do not like being sniffed when they have their collar held or when eating. Another variation is allowing a dog who is following the other one enough leash to sniff the dog he is following briefly before then creating distance. The dog in the front can be receiving treats as it happens. To set my puppy up for success, to feel confident during a positive interaction with a new adult dog named Tank, we first walked with the dogs on leash together and then practiced a settle at a distance from each other and then closer before then allowing the dogs to interact. These three of my adult dogs were extremely comfortable with being loose with the puppy right from the start because they've had so much experience with puppies. Wish, my three-year-old Border Collie, was very fearful as a puppy of dogs and people and especially of being approached and touched. She had an interest in being social, but she was terrified of being touched or having the other dog go near her face, so she would back up towards dogs. She made a lot of progress and started to socialize and play with other dogs, but then when she hit nine months old, the day that she went into heat, it was almost as though her brain reset to being extremely anxious and extremely fearful around dogs, even around my own dogs. Suddenly, she would act terrified if any of my dogs were to walk past her, let alone even approach her. Even today, she requires carefully planned introductions with dogs to prevent her having a fearful or anxious response. She was already very used to having other dogs visit my house while she relaxed behind a barrier, so it made it much easier when bringing the puppy home. I would switch between having Wish behind the barrier, watching the puppy interact with me and the other dogs, and then when the puppy needed a nap, I would put the puppy behind the barrier and Wish could be with the other dogs. At first I used a double barrier so the dogs couldn't go face to face. For some dogs, the barriers might need to be on either end of the room at first so the dogs are 10 or 20 feet away from each other. Wishy, go sniff. Good. Good girl, Wish. I first set up training sessions where the dogs could learn to interact through the barrier with guidance and reinforcement. Here I am throwing a treat behind Wish so I can test to see if she'd like to approach the puppy again or if she would prefer to have a break. If you have a dog that doesn't have a history of being calm, friendly, and benevolent when playing with other dogs of all ages and all situations, when introducing the new dog to your household, I don't suggest that you should just let them play together in the first few encounters and hope that nothing bad happens. The calmer the dogs are, the less likely they'll be to overreact. So by taking it slow, you can build on short, positive experiences, leaving your dog wanting more interactions with the other dog, rather than the first experience of playing being a negative experience for one of the dogs. It's a great sign if your dog initiates play in the first few encounters, but just because your dog tries to initiate play with the other dog doesn't necessarily mean that he won't suddenly feel overwhelmed when actually playing. For example, if the other dog were suddenly to do something that your dog was not expecting, like putting his paws up on your dog's back or biting at your dog playfully. If at any point a dog is getting stressed, overexcited or offering undesirable behavior, you can interrupt the dog using a positively trained cue, such as a recall, an attention noise, or the cue, leave it. Oh, pups. Come here. Let's go play with your toy instead of... If your dog is just not listening, you can separate your dogs and give them a break from each other. It's important to learn what appropriate and inappropriate play looks like in dogs, but at any time when you feel unsure, I suggest interrupting the dogs and having them take a break apart from each other or just working on the settle. Use management and prevention between encounters and interactions. 
Keep the dogs in separate rooms when you have to leave the house to prevent them having negative interactions while you are not home. Having the dogs in the same room with a barrier can be problematic for some dogs because they can intimidate each other or get frustrated by not being able to reach each other. Monitor all interactions in the first stages while the dogs are building their relationship and learning how to interact with each other appropriately. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to channel KikoPup to show your support. You can also become a supporting member of this channel by clicking the join button or clicking the link in the description below. See you later, guys.